There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Liebling moves to amend Senate file number 3656, the second engrossment as amended. And the amendment is coded R818-017. I recognize the member from Olmsted, Representative Liebling, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Well, now we're shifting gears a little bit because, as we know, there are quite a few different subjects in this bill. And the, the amendment that I'm bringing to you today, members, has to do with what is sometimes called junkets. That is trips that we legislators take. Now, I know junkets is kind of a pejorative word, but all of these trips are not bad. In fact, most of them are for good purposes. <clears throat> sometimes we take trips to conferences. Sometimes we take trips to other kinds of meetings to learn about different topics. Sometimes these trips are sponsored by groups like NCSL, the National Conference of State Legislatures, which Minnesota is a member, or the um, CSG, the Co um, Conference of State Governments, I think, and other such groups. So the problem is that in Minnesota, legislators do not have to report when we take a trip that is funded by another person or another organization. And this has been a source of concern over the years. The public has a right to know when we are taking trips on somebody else's dime. That's what this amendment is about. I brought an, a potential amendment, I offered an amendment to the rules, I think it was last year, on this very thing, and the majority voted down my rule amendment. Because other states do this, and I think that we should too. The public simply deserves to know. So what my amendment does is it simply says that the, the House of Representatives and the Senate shall by rule require detailed quarterly reports by members of any trip taken by the member that is paid for or reimbursed by non-government sources other than the legislator, the legislator's family, or the legislator's employer. So when an outside group, whether it be NCSL or ALEC or Women Winning or any of the groups, whichever side of the aisle they support or whether they support no side or whether it's simply um, to learn about a particular topic, you would have to report who was, who was paying your way and how much. And this is, this is not onerous. This is something that under the amendment, the uh, House and the Senate would promulgate rules that could um, take care of any issues that may remain about how specifically this should be done. But this is information the public deserves to have and wants to have. And it goes back to trust in us as an institution. Our salaries are paid by our constituents. We are elected to represent them. And they deserve to know who's paying for us to go here, there, and everywhere. Some of us don't go many places at all, don't take many trips, or maybe no trips. Some of us take a lot of trips. This is not retrospective. It's not meant to punish anybody. It's simply a good government measure that our constituents deserve to know who's paying when we take trips that are not either our family, our employer, or paid for out of our own pockets. So I, I hope that you can support my amendment. And Mr. Speaker, I would ask for roll call. Roll call being requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. There is an amendment to the amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Anderson S. moves to amend the Liebling Amendment to Senate File Number 3656, the second engrossment as amended. And the amendment to the amendment is coded A43. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Anderson S., to your amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to request a roll call on my amendment to the amendment. A roll call being requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, what I do on this men amendment is I change it from must to uh, may, uh, and for a couple of different reasons. Members, we operate um, this body, the Senate operates their body, based on a little set of rules that we have. 
And the set of rules that we have has everything from you can't campaign on the state dime. There's a certain code of conduct that we have. You also can't accept contributions from lobbyists or PACs while you're in session, and a whole host of other rules uh, that guide our body. The Senate uh, also has their own set of rules that helps them uh, figure out how they operate as a body, as an institution. And um, it includes, uh, in our House one, too, we even have a rule that says acceptance of travel and lodging by a member or employee which sets out guidelines of how we can uh, do travel, whether it has to relate uh, to our work as a lawmaker um, or uh, how it applies to uh, our, our lives outside of here with a business uh, trip that we probably have to take. So we have all of those guidelines in place. In this rule book, what Representative Liebling is asking us to do is to ignore this rule book and instead put this language into Minnesota statute. This would then bound not just this legislative body, but every legislative body moving forward. On top of that, it would also um, tell the Senate what, we're, what they have to do as far as their rules go. I don't argue with the merit of what Representative Liebling is trying to do here. I just argue, is this the appropriate place to have it? Where then we are going to have the governor sign off on what our rules of governance are. Uh, instead of having the legislature control that, and not just this legislature, she's trying to control future legislators. So I appreciate the intent of what Representative Liebling is doing. I think this is the wrong place to have it, um, and I would encourage you to vote for my amendment, and uh, appreciate your support. Discussion to the amendment. Representative Liebling. Well, well um, Representative Anderson, you're darn right I want to control future legislatures because the public is going to have a right to know what they do too. This is, this, goes, this is a simple good government issue and what Representative Anderson's amendment does is just gut it. This body already has the ability to promulgate a rule if it shows, so chooses and so does the Senate. So the very point of my amendment is to say you got to do that. You got to have a rule. It doesn't tell you what goes in the rule except for a few very basic items it just says, put together a rule and do it, both in the House and in the Senate, because the public has a right to know who's paying for our trips when we're not paying for them ourselves or it's not paid by our employer. So, you know, if you members, I'm so glad she asked for a roll call, because if she didn't, I was going to, because you all should be on record. We should all be on record. Is this something we should be doing? Because she's gutting. If you're voting with her, if you're voting green on this amendment to the amendment, you are saying, we do not want to be accountable. I hope the press is listening, because this issue has been raised a number of times. I hope people are really watching this, because this should not be a partisan issue. This is an issue about, are we going to be accountable, or are we not? And what this amendment to the amendment is doing is just hiding behind a technicality to say, let's just shove this under the rug again and not deal with it. Members, we should not be doing that. So vote down this amendment to the amendment. Let's say, yes, we're going to be accountable. We, and, and by the way, if you look at the underlying amendment, it's in a section of law where the existing language is about expense reports. And the existing language says, the House of Representatives and Senate shall, by rule, require detailed quarterly reports of expenditures, et cetera, et cetera. So putting it in law in this way is not anything out of the ordinary. It fits right into this other requirement. Saying the House and Senate shall have rules that relate to a particular thing is completely within our purview. This is a way that we get the senators to do this, too, if they all agree and match it up and put it in their bill. We should be doing this. It's just pure and simple, good government accountability, which is something that we should all be for, whichever party we may belong to. So please vote no on the amendment to the amendment. The member from Ramsey, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So members and for Minnesotans, I think it's, we need to be really clear about what's going on here. So the underlying amendment uh, adds a new requirement that the House of Representatives and the Senate um, uh, have detailed quarterly reports by members of trips and who's paid for those trips if it's not a family member or, or an employer. So 
the language offers by Representative, Representative Liebling would require for, I think, the first time that the House and the Senate make known to the public who is paying for trips that representatives and senators are taking. The secondary amendment, the language we're debating right now offers by Representative Anderson, changes that requirement of those reports to permission. We are allowed to require those reports. Well, we haven't done it up until this point. The Republican majority has not. Past majorities have not. And the concern that somehow this um, overcomes our own rules, um, not only is this section referenced by Le uh, Representative Liebling, not only does it reference other kinds of expense reports, other expenses, it's in an entire chapter of the Minnesota statutes that imposes all kinds of requirements on us. I just stumbled on one. I hope Representative Anderson wouldn't mind in section 3.221 the fact that our appropriate committees have to consider how proposed legislation that potentially affects scientific and technological developments conform to our state's science and technology policy. Now that is an imposition on us, right? That's, that is a statutory imposition that we could resent, but a past legislature decided it was a good idea, passed into law, signed by the governor, and it's a requirement on us that we uh, conform to science and technology policy. It seems like it's at least as good an idea, members and Minnesotans, that we let Minnesotans know when we've taken a trip who's paid for that trip. That's all that this is. And the idea that that's somehow an imposition on our rules or other things that we're doing, there's an entire chapter of the Minnesota statutes that imposes requirements upon us and that we live under, and then separate from that, of course, have a series of rules. So I'd certainly urge members to vote down this, uh, this amendment um, and make sure that we are, in fact, required to provide that kind of disclosure to the public that they're demanding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member from Dakota, Representative Halverson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is distressing to me that we are debating how transparent to be with the public. <clears throat> Um, since I arrived at the legislature, um, I have made transparency in government um, a priority. And I have attempted to increase transparency with our economic disclosure. And I've attempted to increase transparency within our um, election system and, and election funding. And um, I have supported uh, Representative Liebling's efforts to change transparency within our rules um, to make sure the public knows um, how we're taking our trips if they're funded by a third party. That to me seems reasonable. It is an absolute honor and a privilege to sit in these chairs. And we are given that privilege by the people in our districts. And there's a lot of talk um, nationwide about how privileged politicians can be. And some people believe, um, you know, that we're living high off the hog maybe or making big money, making big salaries here. We know the truth. Um, we're doing the work to represent our districts. And I really truly believe that the people who are sitting in these um, chairs um, today and the people who work so hard to get elected to represent their districts have their, their constituents' best interests in mind. And with that, I think that it, 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 it's very clear that part of keeping your constituents' best interests in mind is being as clear and transparent as possible with the way that we conduct business here. And that we honor the privilege that it is to sit in these chairs. And we honor the people who put us here by being as transparent as possible. It baffles me that we have to debate whether or not we're going to be transparent with the public about what it takes to do our job and um, any potential um, conflicts that exist and any time that we are given the privilege of going on a trip. And these trips are great. I mean, we, we can, very often people are going and learning and interacting with folks from other states and bringing information back. I'm not ashamed for a second to let the public know exactly how I do my job. None of us should be. And if we are, that's the problem. So please, please vote for transparency. This amendment to the amendment is very concerning. Please don't support it. The member from Wright, Representative Lucero. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I am wondering if uh, Representative Liebling would stand for a question. She will. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So when I'm reading the language here, Representative Liebling, I'm seeing three terms, trip, family, and employer. So I am wondering if those three terms are defined in this section of law. Representative Liebling. Mr. Speaker, members, uh, Representative Lucero, I purposely wrote the amendment in this way because it leaves it up to the House and the Senate to, by rule, define whatever the bodies believe needs to be better defined. So that is left open. I think there are some meanings that most of us can probably agree on, but you're right, it may need some further definition. This is not an amendment that attempts to fill out, flesh out every little bit of that, just put, to put the main things in, in that need to be covered. So it needs to be that you, who paid and how much was paid. But certainly there's room to define those terms in rule. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So given the, the language as written, it is extremely vague as we, we just heard. So a trip could include a road trip. I might ride with somebody else who's not a family member up to Duluth. I might take other uh, rides within the state. And the question becomes, am I now going to have to declare those? They have nothing to do with any political context whatsoever. There is a, uh, a missionary group that's going to be coming here to Minnesota uh, in several weeks. And I know that there's our group of people that are going to be traveling together. In fact, I was actually asked uh, to use one of my, my 15 passenger vans to, to drive the trip. And so if somebody else is driving on this trip to a missionary conference, is that now going to have to be declared? because it was a trip, and the driver potentially or likely is going to be somebody who's not a family member. So members, uh, this, the, language, the vagueness of the language is definitely concerning. I think it's overly broad. Thank you. The member from Morrison, Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, members. And to my colleagues on the other side, interesting. Don't we all send out press releases announcing where we're going and the great things we're doing? I, I was happy to be a toll fellow. I've encouraged members from around here to apply to be a toll fellow, or to join CSG, or to do the build program, or to go to some of the leadership opportunities that we have because they make us better legislators. And to suggest that you're not telling your member or your constituents where you're going, well, that's on us. I mean, what Representative Anderson's language simply does is it recognizes the fact that we want to be transparent, and if we need to change the rules in the future, we should. Representative Liebling even said, in fact, the Senate would have to pass the same rules to make it happen. So, oh my gosh, let's put this forward and let's make sure the Senate does too, because if they don't pass it, it wouldn't apply to both bodies. So, to the public, if you're out there and you're worried about transparency, Call your representative. Ask them. And if they don't call you back, that's another matter. But call me. I talk to constituents all the time. I put out press releases. I am so proud of the things that I do for my constituents and the places that I go because that makes me better. Never embarrassed of the trips I take. And of course, they're never inappropriate. Because we know the difference, the campaign finance laws, and things are pretty sticky about what line to cross. I think we all know that. So I hope that we're not suggesting that there's some impropriety going here, or my goodness, that there's a lack of transparency. And if you're taking it to that step, look inside your soul and ask yourself, am I taking trips I shouldn't be taking? Because that's a whole other matter. But to try to legislate and suggest that there's this lack of transparency on the trips we're taking, oh my goodness. Have we really gone to that extent? I've seen so many of you at great conferences, at education conferences, and we've learned together, and we've had opportunities to travel and do wonderful things that bring outside perspectives here, and to suggest for a moment that we act inappropriately when we're trying to be better legislators? Don't be fooled by the rhetoric and the possible political messages that are going to hit postcards in November. In fact, be a person of integrity that we all are and do the right thing. Put a press release out and announce where you go. 
If you've been to trips, Representative Halverson, that's great. You say you've been to all these trips. Have you posted a list on your website? Or are we just doing this for political gain? Members, we are transparent. We are good people. I know I serve alongside of many of you in committees and in conversations. And fine, upstanding people represent the people in their districts for the most part. You can look in the past, and I'm sure there's been some ones. But I will tell you, and I, I often tell this to the people when I go back home, no matter what side of the aisle, the people that I stand shoulder to shoulder with care about the people they represent, and they're not trying to deceive. In fact, they're trying to be better, and they're trying to do it so that they can improve the lives of the people they represent. So do not fall into the trap that there is this shroud of trips that are being taken and offered to us. We know better. Members, I would support the Representative Anderson Amendment. Further discussion to the A43 Amendment. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to respond to a couple of the things that have been said here. First of all, the way the amendment, the underlying amendment is written, the House and Senate would each promulgate rules. Those rules could be the same or they could be different, as each body would suggest. You know, um, the idea that this is overly broad and that it doesn't cover every single nuance in every situation, that's why you promulgate rules. And I must say that, you, you know, if you want to be against something, we've seen this many, many times, members, if you want to be against something, you can find a reason. There's a word wrong, it doesn't cover everything, it's too broad, it's too narrow, it's too high, it's too low. It's too fat, it's too thin, whatever you want to say, it's wrong, you'll vote no. You'll always find a reason. But your constituents want this. The public wants this. I started out saying this is not about going after anybody, and it's not to say that every trip is a bad trip. Representative Kresha talking about some of the good trips we take, you are right. And you know what? A lot of the legislators from other states that we meet on those trips are reporting the trip when they get back home. And I've experienced a lot that a lot of um, the time they'll say, and, and here's how much was paid for your trip so that you can report when you get home. This is not a strange thing. A lot of legislators are doing this. And you think that we're transparent enough now because your legislators know that you go on these trips? I mean, you're not telling them how much is paid for you to go. We're not, if you're not embarrassed by the trips you're taking, why be afraid to report them? Why not put them on a website? Maybe it's a good thing. Some of our constituents think it's a good thing for us to be going to these conferences. I think it's a good thing, because we do learn a lot. We get, some, we get ideas from other legislators. But it is a perk of the job, or maybe it's, you know, for at least for those of us who like to travel, maybe for some it's a, not a perk, I don't know. But I think a lot of our, a lot of our constituents think it's a perk, and they want to know where are we going and who is paying for it. And I think it's very fair for them to know that. So, you know, if you're not embarrassed by the trips you're taking, there's no reason to oppose this. And this is, this is going forward anyway. If you went some places you don't want to reveal and you don't want to say who paid and you don't want to say how much was paid, that's in the past. Going forward, it'll be under scrutiny a little more scrutiny, and you maybe if you're embarrassed about some of the things you did and some of the money that you took to go there, maybe you'll think more about it going forward when it's going to be public. This is something every member should be voting on the amendment to the amendment. Every member should be voting no because it makes the underlying amendment completely meaningless. And then we should vote for the underlying amendment and let our constituents finally know who's paying when we take trips. Thank you. The member from Stearns, Representative Howe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Liebling, I don't know, uh, maybe you need to be more transparent. I have not have been contacted by any of my constituents about not being transparent and tell them where the money is going and where these trips come from. So apparently you're getting contacted a lot much more than I am. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing none, a roll call being requested on the A43 amendment. Clerk will take the roll.
Clerk will close the roll. There being 71 ayes, 54 nays, the A43 amendment is adopted. Members, we return to the underlying amendment, the RA 18-017, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, members, since the majority voted to gut the underlying amendment, it is no longer requiring any transparency. It just now tells the House and Senate they can do whatever they want to do. It makes, no longer makes any sense to go forward, so I will withdraw the amendment. Representative Liebling withdraws the RA 18-017 amendment. Representative Driscoll, for what purpose do you rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Point of personal privilege. State your point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, today um, we are discussing, among other things, the agriculture bill and how appropriate that we would have with us um, some members from Taiwan. And we have from the Taipei Economic and Culture Office in Chicago, Illinois, a delegation that is here representing the uh, folks of Taiwan. And they are here today to continue increasing trade with the state of Minnesota and the Midwest. Taiwan had sent a delegation here in 2017 to increase agricultural trade with Minnesota. And they have agreed to buy over $3 billion in the Midwest of corn, soybean, and wheat products from, from the United States. They are back today to continue that relationship to expand Minnesota products and agricultural products going to Southeast Asia and South Asia. And not only are they here to do a trade mission, they're also here for a cultural exchange. And later this evening, the, um, the, the delegation has brought along with them a group and a performance called Light Up Taiwan, which will be performed over at the St. Paul campus here at the University of Minnesota. And the woman who is to your left is the city of Sartell's mayor, the city that I hail from. And she was selected as one of the mayors here in the United States to represent the United States in Taiwan here about six weeks ago and has had a lot of uh, opportunity to work with them. So the mayor is Sarah Jane Nickel from Sartell, the director general, um, Eric Hohan, and the deputy director, Erica Lee. Would you please help me welcome and thank them for being trade partners with us. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Freiburg moves to amend Senate file number 3656. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A14. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Freiburg, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I would like a roll call on this amendment. Roll call being requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Freiburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This amendment deletes provisions of the bill that we heard in the Government Operations Committee. The provisions which this amendment would delete prohibit the Attorney General's office from entering into a contingency fee, with one exception that was recently added. Uh, this would be an unprecedented change around the country. I don't know of any other state that has such a strict restriction on contingency fees. Existing law places limits on when large contingency fees can be used. For any fee over $1 million, the Attorney General has to submit the proposed contract to the Legislative Coordinating Commission. In committee, we heard that large contingency fees are rarely used by the Attorney General's office. There are two primary examples in the last quarter century or so, the tobacco settlement of the late 90s and the recent litigation against 3M. Both of these lawsuits share one quality. They are very large lawsuits against large corporate entities with almost unlimited resources. There was extensive discovery, expert witnesses, and court filings in each instance of litigation. This is exactly the type of litigation where you want the Attorney General's office to have the necessary tools to protect the public interest. 
The office lacks the resources to handle all of the discovery, expert witness costs, and court filing fees by itself. By being able to involve firms with expertise through a contingency fee, the Attorney General's office can more fully vindicate the public interest. Without a contingency fee, attorney fees from private firms would be unaffordable or would cost state taxpayers an extensive amount of money. Without a contingency fee, there would be no incentive for firms to participate in litigation like the 3M or tobacco cases. I should also mention that if you subtract the fee from the settlement amount, the 3M case still yielded over $700 million to help alleviate an environmental crisis in the East Metro. This amendment would just maintain the status quo. The status quo has worked well for us, and I encourage members to vote green. Discussion to the A14 amendment. The member from Hennepin, Representative Anderson S. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I'm going to recommend a red vote on this amendment, and let me tell you why. We just uh, had a settlement here recently in the state where out of the settlement, the state gave up $125 million to the law firm that was on a contingency fee basis hired by the AG to do the work of the AG. $125 million. That law firm earned $47,000 per day for seven years on that lawsuit. They weren't an employee of the state. They weren't hired on an hourly fee, which is something the AG's office can already do. Instead, their payout was all based on a contingency fee arrangement. And if that doesn't concern you, it should. This is a trend that is happening on a national basis where attorney generals are moving towards contingency fee contracts with law firms that have no accountability to the legislature, no accountability to the citizens of this state. Their sole job is to look out for their bottom line. So if they're worried about, hey, they're spending too much money on this lawsuit, then they can just cash out and say, we're taking this fee, we're done, we're out of here, we're going to settle. Yeah, 850, that sounds great. Instead of looking out at, is this the right settlement amount and is this what we should be getting for the taxpayers of Minnesota, for the people that are looking for the water, clean water? No, instead what we are doing is we're saying we're going to have guns for hire that are substitute AGs. I'll tell you, nobody elected these law firms. Nobody said, I'm going to uh, vote for the Larson Larson Johnson law firm. No, they voted for a specific attorney general who has over 200 attorneys under her purview. Now, they might not have all the expertise, but the AG still has the authority to hire an attorney based on an hourly fee or as an employee of the state. And she does that on a regular basis. If there's expertise needed on a court case, that is done on a regular basis. But instead here, what we're saying is we're going to have these guys come in and do this work that have no accountability to the taxpayers of Minnesota. Let me just describe to you what's happened in other states. So we have a, another AG that hired a firm for on a contingency fee basis. That firm decided, I'm going to go out and bribe a judge so that I can get the court a case settled for a higher amount. So do you think that was about the court case itself, about defending the state, or was it about padding their pocketbook? That person was brought, that law firm was brought up on bribe charges, and I don't want to see that happening here in the state of Minnesota. There's example after example of this kind of corruption happening throughout the nation. This is our opportunity here in Minnesota to make sure that doesn't happen here. Vote no on this amendment. It's the wrong idea. The member from Hennepin, Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. And Representative Anderson, that would be well and good if you actually funded the AG's office to do the job of holding corporations responsible for the damage they do to Minnesotans. Uh, members, I just want to lay out a little bit of truth about uh, the lawsuit and the contingency fee. Uh, that was uh, done with the lawsuit against 3M. Members, in December of 2010, the state of Minnesota filed a lawsuit against 3M seeking payment for natural resource damages 
caused by 3M's disposal, disposals of PFCs in the east metropolitan area of the Twin Cities. And they'd done it for several decades. The lawsuit was brought by the Attorney General and the Minnesota Commissioner of, Pol of Pollution Control and Natural Resources acting as a trustee. They are a trustee of Minnesota's natural resources. And in February of 2018, the lawsuit was settled after seven years of intense litigation involving 27 million pages of documents, 27 million pages of documents, taking approximately 200 witness depositions, over $10 million in tests and fees and costs, over 100 judicial hearings and conferences, over 1,600 court filings, and nonstop negotiations lasting 22 hours just before the trial was set to begin. Representative Anderson, you have done nothing but cut the Attorney General's office the entire time you've been in chair, every single time we see a budget. So Representative Anderson, I believe that this provision in this bill is another attempt on your part to, to try to cut the AG's ability to actually hold corporations responsible for the damages they do to Minnesotans. Shame on you. Representative Garofalo for a yeah, Thank rights. you, Mr. Speaker and members. And Representative Anderson, I'm not going to ask you to yield, but I'm going to ask you a question. How much money did these lawyers make on this one case? Was that was it $1.2 million? How much did they make, Representative Anderson? She will yield, Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Garofalo, they made $125 million, $47,000 per day for the last seven years. Representative Garofalo. Well, Mr. Speaker and members, I've heard the DFL defend a lot of strange things lately, but this takes the cake. $125 million, and you asked for a roll call on it? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> the member from Washington, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members. Um, when it comes to the 3M lawsuit, that is my area that is affected. And I will tell you one thing, and one thing, members, the people of my area are wondering, how in the heck did the AG get so much money for these outside lawyers? $47,000 a day. Now, I understand there was a lot of work to go into it. I understand the AG's got a lot of work that needs to be done and may sometimes have to sub out work opportunities. But the amount of money that was put forward and that we got back does not equal enough. So the people of my area want to know where this money went. So I'd suggest a no vote. The member from Dakota, Representative Halverson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, I have to say, joking about this lawsuit to me is very offensive. What has happened to the communities in the East Metro because of the actions of 3M is devastating. Today, we found out that nobody should ever eat a fish caught in Lake Elmo because of what happened. The Attorney General is charged with ensuring that Minnesotans' consumers are protected and that Minnesotans are protected. I asked, I had the opportunity to ask the Attorney General's office about this case. And we know the outcome today. The Attorney General's office won. And the Attorney General's office won significant, a significant settlement for the people of the East Metro to start cleanup today on the devastation that has been rained down on their communities. On the risks that were put into their drinking water. You turn on your tap and you want to know that your water is clean. You make a bottle for your baby and you want to know that your water is clean. You take your kid down to the lake behind your house and you catch a fish and you want to teach him how to fillet that fish and fry it up and you want to know that that is safe. The people of the East Metro had no guarantee of safety. 
The people of the East Metro deserve to have their environment cleaned up. And so laughing about the fact that our Attorney General um, took this on and won is offensive because we are talking about the health and safety not only of today's residents of the East Metro, but the future residents of the East Metro. And so I asked the Attorney General's office how certain the outcome of this was when they decided to take this on. And in fact, it was a pretty big risk. And you talk about protecting the bottom line. Um, the Attorney General's office is also charged with looking at the bottom line because the Attorney General is an elected official accountable to the taxpayer. And so the Attorney General's office is um, looking to the bottom line to make sure that they can get an appropriate settlement for the people that have been harmed in this particular case. And they didn't have certainty going into this. It was a big case and it took many, many years. Um, but they did what they had to do for the people of the East Metro. And because of that, we received a settlement. Um, we received a settlement for the folks of the East Metro so that they can begin their cleanup and so that the people who are raising children in the East Metro are going to have a brighter future and a safer future for their kids. But make no mistake, there's a lot of work to do. Um, and the resources that were won by the Office of the Attorney General are going to make a big difference to the, to the folks. And so um, t to laugh and, and flippantly criticize um, makes no sense to me at all. The member from Hennepin, Representative Waginius. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members. I'm going to give you another example of the Attorney General uh, working on the behalf now of counties who had old landfills that were leaking into the groundwater and polluting wells, private wells, people's drinking water wells around the landfill. And we passed a bill um, trying to hold insurance companies liable for, um, well, Insurance, there were insurance policies on some of these old landfills, and we wanted to see if we could collect on those. And the Attorney General did not have the expertise in this narrow, narrow uh, area of insurance law. <laughs> it turns out one of my shirktail relatives at Yale Law School said this, not knowing that I had passed the bill, was making fun of Minnesota, saying Minnesota will never collect, never. But the Attorney General hired uh, a Washington, D.C. law firm, isn't that bad? Uh, hired a Washington, D.C. law firm uh, in, in a major, outstanding case, brought home for Minnesotans over $100 million. And since that was 20 years ago, <laughs> that was real money. That was money that the counties did not have to pay to clean up their own landfills. So I think there are more examples out there. Uh, we're looking at two recent ones. I'm telling you about an older one. I'm sure there are others in between. We should not forego this opportunity uh, to support Minnesotans. The member from Washington, Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. $125 million. Representative Halverson, thank you for making our point for us. This is my district that's affected. Afton, Denmark Township, Cottage Grove. That's $125 million that they're not going to get to use for bottled water. $125 million they're not going to get to use for a new filtration system so that they have clean drinking water. I'm not laughing and I'm not joking, this is serious. And that's $125 million that the residents in my district won't have because the lawyers made $47,000 a day for seven years. Think about that. What would you do if this was your district? The Minority Leader, Representative Hortman. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wonder if Representative Garofalo would yield to a question. He will. Representative Hortman. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Garofalo, how much money did the people of the state of Minnesota receive in that settlement? Representative Garofalo. Uh, Mr. Speaker, whatever it was, it was $125 million less than it should have been. Representative Hortman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Representative Garofalo, before we talk about things on the House floor, I think it's usually good if we know what we're talking about. Um, in this particular case, the Attorney General achieved a $725 million recovery for the people of the state of Minnesota. That is a $725 million recovery that would not have been possible without a contingent fee arrangement with an outside law firm. Representative Garofalo, the other thing that I think is important to understand about contingent fee arrangements is that the lawyers only get paid when there is success. So the position that you are taking is that the state of Minnesota should always risk its own money and never engage others in sharing that risk when going after big recoveries. The tobacco settlement never would have been reached under a conventional billing arrangement with lawyers. And so what it, it sounds like is that you would rather not have entities be held accountable for their conduct. Representative Garofalo. Would Representative Hortman yield for a question? She will yield. Representative Thank Garofalo. You. Mr. Speaker, Representative Hortman, if $125 million to get lawyers rich isn't too much, how much is? Representative Hortman. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Garofalo. It is very expensive to sue a company like 3M. A company like 3M can devastate any kind of a small entity, uh, like 200 lawyers at the state of Minnesota, with discovery requests. For the law firm to undertake the risk to put in the time to try to get recovery was a substantial risk that the law firm would lose billable hours and other opportunity cost. And when a law firm takes a risk like that, that is reflected in the compensation. And you know, it's interesting to me that the Republican side of the aisle believes that there's no such thing as making too much money for a corporation and that, that, that they shouldn't have to pay taxes like everybody else and that there's no such thing as too much in corporate tax cuts, but yet when we have attorneys who are business people engaging in a business proposition for which they are successful, suddenly Republicans are against people making money. Representative Garofalo. Thank you. Would Representative Hartman yield for one more question? She will yield. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Hartman. Well, I guess I knew that the L and DFL didn't stand for labor anymore. Now I know it stands for lawyers. So now I got that figured out. But Representative Hartman, just a simple question. What if it was $900 million? What if the contingency fee, instead of being $125 million, was $900 million? Would you at least agree with this side of the aisle that that would be too much? Or are we going to continue advocating here on the House floor for making sure that the, uh, the partners in the law firms are adequately compensated for their difficult and challenging work? Representative Horton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Garofalo, I think that when the recovery for the state is seven to one, what the lawyers received, that it's a good proposition for the state to enter into that agreement every day of the week whether it's suing tobacco companies who lied to consumers, suing oil companies who lied to consumers, or suing 3M who polluted the water enjoyed by Minnesotans. Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would actually encourage DFL members to follow the advice of the minority leader. I encourage every DFL member to vote for this amendment. The member from St. Louis, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the taxpayers didn't pay for that. The corporation paid for that, for the attorney fees, because the state won the case. The state won the case. So it, as long as we recouped the cost, the state gains, even if we gained a penny more. In fact, it, it led to higher employment in Minnesota. So I think the attorney general did the right thing. When you take on a large corporation, it's expensive if you want to win, and the state of Minnesota won. 
The member from Hennepin, Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, this lawsuit related to a hundred square miles of an underground plume of PFC chemicals in the East Metro area. And the money was paid by 3M as a restricted grant with the primary purpose to construct clean drinking water system for communities located in the, with the contaminated plume. Now, in addition to the settlement that was received, that we have the $890 million, if that amount of money is exhausted, 3M will still be on the hook to make certain that we have clean drinking water. Now, the problem is, in this bill, not only is there this provision that allows or stops the Attorney General from having contingency fees, but this bill actually interferes with the settlement. And we heard testimony in the Ways and Means Committee that it may put the settlement at risk and there may not be a settlement and that it may go back to a lawsuit because the language in this bill directly interferes with the court order. So Representative Frankie, if you care about your district and you care about it actually being fixed and the water being cleaned up, you should care very much about the interference by this body in the court ordered settlement. Representative Dabney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, just a, a point of information that may be relevant to this debate. Uh, just today, the Minnesota Department of Health issued fish consumption guidelines for a number of lakes uh, in the metro area, uh, <clears throat> several in, in Minneapolis, the city of lakes, but specifically also uh, fish consumption guidelines for Lake Elmo, restricting uh, or encouraging people to restrict their consumption because of the health problems related specifically to the 3M chemical pollution. Thank you. The member from Washington, Rep Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Representative Davney. And again, thank you for proving our point because now there's $125 million that the people of our district, the people of Lake Elmo, don't have available to them because the lawyers have it. Thank you. The member from Ramsey, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, look, uh, Representative Anderson referred a while back to the Attorney General and the Attorney General's responsibility. The Attorney General made the determination that for various reasons that probably did include past budget cuts, this is not something that she was able to take on and to win. $125 million netted us $850 million and, and clean water and dealing with pollution. If there's a, if there's a higher payout, a $900 million was referenced by uh, Representative Garofalo, that would translate to six, more than $6 billion in return. The point is there would have been zero is what the Attorney General is telling us. And we're relying on her in saying that. And we know that that amount ended up returning to the state a much higher amount and getting us clean drinking water as well. I would urge members to, um, to support the Freiburg Amendment. Thank you. The member from Washington, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was wondering if Representative Anderson S. would yield for a question. She will. Representative Frankie. Representative Anderson, can you tell me, would this legislation impact this settlement moving forward to the best of your knowledge? Representative Anderson S. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Hillstrom said that this would impact the lawsuit settlement for 3M. It does not. This is only for contingency fee arrangements moving forward. So this does not impact the 3M settlement at all. Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative. The member from Dakota, Representative Halverson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, again, I, I, I rise with uh, great disappointment. A um, couple things I know for sure. The schools in the East Metro are real good, and I know I've got a cousin who's got her kid in, in the Lake Elmo School, and, and I know they're teaching math and they're teaching it well. Um, we did the math for you guys on this side of the aisle in terms of what the Minnesota taxpayer was on the hook for with regard to these uh, fees um, that the attorneys collected. The Minnesota taxpayer was not on the hook for anything. Um, we were about mitigating risk for the Minnesota taxpayer to make sure that we provided the state of Minnesota with everything that they needed to get justice for the people of the East Metro. Um, why we're debating that is, is kind of beyond me. Why we're saying 
you got a $725 million settlement for communities that were severely damaged by the actions of an entity in the East Metro. And why we're saying we're going to tie your hands to make sure that the state of Minnesota can never represent communities again and get that kind of settlement again. It is beyond me. What happened with those contingency fees is that the state of Minnesota said, boy, we don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know if this case is winnable. By entering into the contingency uh, arrangement, they found um, a partner that was willing to say, we will join in the risk with you, the state of Minnesota. We will help protect the taxpayers of the state of Minnesota. And we will work to get justice for the people of Minnesota. Minnesota won. Without this action, we would not be talking about the, the money that was available to clean up the filthy water, to clean up the contaminated groundwater, to clean the contaminated lakes that we don't get to fish in in the East Metro. There's an interesting question that's been raised. Um, lots of uh, attacks, partisan attacks. Um, lots of attacks on um, the DFL for saying that we are standing up for clean water. Where is the GOP for standing up for clean water? When we get an alert from the Minnesota Department of Health that the fish in your districts aren't consumable, you should be concerned. And to say that you want to tie the hand of the state of Minnesota from protecting consumers from this egregious kind of behavior is beyond me. And if, if you want to make the arguments, make the arguments. But this whole notion that we're going to be cute and make fun of something so, so serious is beyond me. And be honest about what the taxpayers paid and what the taxpayers got. The taxpayers were, the, were being protected in this situation, and we are going to um, see the rewards of a $725 million settlement. Again, I want the kids growing up in that part of the state, and I'm related to a lot of the kids growing up in that part of the state, I want them to enjoy the beauty that is Minnesota with our lakes. I want them to turn on their taps and know that the water they're drinking is safe. And I want them to be able to, I want those moms to be able to make bottles for their babies um, and know that their water is safe. And nobody was being robbed in this situation. The fact is, is the Minnesota consumer was being protected. Our future is being protected. To take away the ability of the state of Minnesota to go to bat for, for the people of Minnesota is just plain wrong. The member from Hennepin, Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I want to give you a couple of numbers. Five billion, five billion dollars. Five billion dollars is the number, the dollar figure that this settlement was supposed to be. We read it in the paper. The AG said it many times. The entire governor's administration said five billion dollars. And what did we get? With hired for gun a law firm? outside of state government, we got $850, $50 million. Meanwhile, $125 million of that was diverted to their pocket. I'm sure they're thinking, I'm going to Disney World. Shoot. I wonder how many cars they could buy with $125 million. How many trips they could take with $125 million. How many campaign donations this law firm will make with the hundred and twenty five million dollars. It's a lot of money. We've got a situation where we're creating an environment where it's, where it's a pay to play for law firms
to work for the AG and have no accountability to the taxpayers of Minnesota. All they got to do is make sure that they settle, get their cash out, but not really worry about the fact that they could have gotten more. $125 million. I wonder how many baby bottles that would fill with water. I wonder how many $125 million, how many filtration systems, like you said, would purchase. But we won't know that because that's going to a private law firm instead of the people in the area affected by this lawsuit. Mistake was made. We're going to make sure that that never gets made again. Don't forget, $5 billion. The member from Olmsted, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, I've been listening to this debate, and I keep looking at the language in the bill and all of this discussion about the settlement. And, um, you know, I have to say, when I first heard what the attorney fees were going to be in the, in the settlement we've been talking about, I also thought it was a lot of money. You know, that, that is true. But I, as has been said here, of course, when you have contingent fees, what that means is if there isn't a settlement, the money to the lawyers is zero. Or if they don't, I should say, if there's no recovery, the amount is zero. So, you know, th that, that's been discussed here on the floor. But looking at the language of the underlying amendment that's being deleted here, first of all, it's really notable to me that the, the language in the bill that's being deleted does not deal with what occurred. It goes forward. It looks forward. We just had a debate on my amendment on which a member got up and said it was overly broad. It strikes me that the Republican majority here is attempting to solve a problem by, in, you know, if you've got a splinter in your finger, you don't cut off the hand. And it seems to me that that's the kind of thing that's being done here, to just say we won't do any contingent fee agreements anymore. Because usually the Republican majority loves outsourcing stuff, loves using the private sector instead of the public sector. In the health and human services area, we hear this all the time. Government doesn't seem to do anything right, according to the Republicans. They, all, they will always, you always want to bring in somebody, a private vendor, to do this, that, or the other, except apparently when it comes to lawyers. Then, then it's no good to do that. We notice that the underlying language here in the section that's being deleted actually exempts and talks about some of the um, outside third-party vendors that the Republican majority wants to use in the health and human services area because obviously in that area it's better to use the private sector. I mean, I think this is uh, just a, a ridiculously overbroad, to use that member's language, overbroad section of the bill. It seems really clear that there are times when hiring an outside vendor, whether it be a lawyer, whether it be some other kind of firm, is a good idea. And there are other times when it's better to do that in-house. And it seems clear that in, when we're talking about very large lawsuits against very deep-pocketed defendants, that sometimes it, it makes sense to go to an outside law firm. But yet, what this bill is doing is completely cutting off the option to do that. I also noted, looking at the underlying language, that existing law seems to say, it already puts a guardrail around this. Existing law already says that there's a limit of a million dollars. Um, it says the attorney general may not enter into a contract for legal services to which the fees and expenses paid by the state exceed or can reasonably be expected to exceed a million dollars unless the attorney general first submits the proposed contract to the legislative advisory commission and waits at least 20 days to receive a possible recommendation from the commission. So there's already a guardrail here. It might have been reasonable for the majority to put in more guardrails going forward if that seems reasonable. But this is just cutting off the whole hand to get rid of the splinter. It makes no sense. It's bad for us going forward. And even if you're shocked by the big number that the attorneys got, I mean, sometimes 
I think maybe I went into the wrong field of law when I see these numbers. Because let's face it, some attorneys make very good money. They do. And maybe we do want to put some guard rules around, guardrails around that, but not this, members. This is just absurd. This goes way too far. This, goes, this is about going forward. And the next big case, the next big polluter, is going to be laughing at us because we won't have the resources to go after them and to de defend our people. Whether they be polluters or some other kind of bad actor, we won't have the resources. This is tying our hands behind our back if we pass this bill as it's written. So I fully support the amendment. And let's, let's go forward and, and uh, not take away our own ability to protect our people, because that's what the bill is doing. So vote yes on the amendment. Representative Freiberg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you for deferring to me to the end. It was hard to not say anything throughout that debate, but I've been keeping, I've been keeping notes here. Um, so just to respond to a few things that have come up. First of all, uh, Representative Anderson stated that the settlement was supposed to be $5 billion. Uh, you know, I, I understand maybe the Attorney General's office or the Department of Health made an initial statement about the potential for health effects in the East Metro, and that figure was used, but there's no guarantee that that's, that that's the state, of, you know, that there's gonna be any relief, much less $5 billion. I mean, this was taking a big risk here. The city, from what, I, from what I've heard, the city of Stillwater, before the Attorney General's lawsuit, uh, took, uh, took, this, took this issue on and lost. This was a big risk. This was a big risk for the Attorney General. This was a big risk for the attorneys from the private firm that participated in it. And from what I've heard, the rate that they used was lower than the market percentage, the contingency fee rate. There was testimony to that effect in the Government Operations Committee when we spoke about it. Now, there was a statement made uh, that there's no accountability, that these are private guns for hire. You know, there is accountability. The Attorney General is still the lead agency, the, still the lead plaintiff in the lawsuit. They have control over this. Uh, there's, you know, they are the ones in charge here. There was a reference, which I don't understand at all, to a judge being bribed. That reference was made in the Government Operations Committee as well. Um, I googled that to try to figure out what that's in reference to, as near as I can tell. It's, it's an attorney uh, from Mississippi, who was, who was caught uh, in a case that wasn't, that I don't think was even, I don't even know if it was a contingency fee case and a case brought by the Attorney General. I mean, you know, it's, it's a different state dealing with different laws, and the fact is, even there, the attorney was caught. If, uh, you know, if he's, it says to me, the law was working there. If he's caught bribing a judge, he should be found guilty and, and suffer the consequences of that. And he was. Uh, there's nothing like that going on here in Minnesota, as far as I can tell. We have ethical leaders here. The, uh, we have ethical leaders in the Attorney General's office. Uh, finally, uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the fee. As I mentioned in my opening comments here, if you subtract the fee uh, from the amount awarded, there is still over $700 million that is going to help alleviate an environmental crisis in the East Metro. The alternative to that is zero. The at Attorney General would not have the resources. You know, the, the costs to this case aren't all going to buy cars and so forth. They're paying the extremely high costs of expert witnesses. They're paying all the discovery fees. There was millions of pages of discovery. In this case, the tobacco settlement, like there's a case where there are 70 millions of pages of documents. There is a whole document repository kept just because of the amount of discovery that came out of that case. That is not something that 200 attorneys in the Attorney General's office can handle on their own. This, um, the, the provisions which this amendment would delete should be called the Corporate Unaccountability Act. There is no, there is no incentive for, for the Attorney General's office to act to protect public health, to protect the environment, to ensure that we have clean water in some of these cases against massive corporate entities that have the ability to deluge uh, a small firm, which a medium-sized firm, which maybe you could consider the Attorney General's office to be, with discovery requests, with frivolous motions. So, you know, 
there's concern trolling that I'm detecting coming from the other side about how, you know, I hope you vote for this. Well, frankly, I hope the other side votes no on this as well. This, you know, this, to vote for this, to have this go into a law would deprive people from other regions of the state of the same privilege afforded to the residents of the East Metro, and that is the right to have their public health interests vindicated by the Attorney General's office. Vote yes on this amendment. There being a roll call requested on the amendment, the clerk will take the roll. Clerk will close the roll. There being 47 ayes and 77 nays, the A14 amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Schultz moves to amend Senate file number 3656, the second engrossment as amended as follows, and the amendment is coded A25. I call upon the member from St. Louis, Representative Schultz, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My amendment reforms our redistricting process, the process of drawing the lines or the boundaries for congressional and state legislative districts. It takes it out of our hands, hands of elected officials, us legislators and gives it to a bipartisan commission of five retired judges and four members of our community. The commission would create redistricting principles to use to draw the boundaries. It would hold public meetings across our state and it would provide and would listen to members of our community about ideas and inputs and maps for our redistricting. The amendment also deletes the Republicans' principles in the current bill, principles that actually protects incumbents, which is the majority, whom are Republicans. It makes the process, which makes the process even more political when you try to protect incumbents. In 2010, the 2010 race, millions of dollars poured into the race from Republicans and conservatives across the state legislative races. And it resulted in the Republicans gaining 700 seats in state legislatures, the largest increase in our history. It resulted in 20 state chambers moving from Democratic to Republican majority, and the money bought total Republican control in 25 states. In 2012, 1.7 million more votes were cast for Democrats than Republicans, but thanks to gerrymandering, Republicans won 33 congressional seats in 2012. This is not a fair process. Gerrymandering is putting our democracy at risk. Democracy, which is the foundation of our country. We need to do more to protect it, and we need to remove the politics as much as possible from the process. Elected officials should not be picking voters. The voters, the people of Minnesota, should be selecting their elected officials. So I urge you to vote for this amendment because we cannot further diminish our democracy. This is the one power people have, the power to vote, and vote for their elected officials. There is an amendment to the amendment at the desk. The clerk will report that amendment. 
Anderson S. moves to amend the Schultz Amendment to Senate File Number 3656, the second of Grossman as amended. The amendment to the amendment is coded A51. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Anderson, to your amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, uh, I had the honor and privilege of chairing the redistricting committee the last time uh, the state went through that process. And I can tell you that it was a very, um, I learned a lot through that process about how map making works and what all the laws are regarding redistricting and how Minnesota stands out from the rest of the states in the nation because we do a good job here in the state of Minnesota and how we handle these things. And part of that is guided by the principles that we use when it comes to redistricting. Uh, we've had Peter Watson, who is a national expert on redistricting, that um, has worked on uh, principles and the importance of having those state by state. And I had the opportunity to hear him give these speeches to other states on many different occasions. And uh, the problem, though, that we still have in Minnesota is that we don't have our principles in state statute. So we are at the whim of the next redistricting um, time frame for principles to be adopted. And if we don't have the principles adopted here at the legislature, our fallback as a default for the state of Minnesota is then the courts draw the redistricting lines. And then the courts develop their own uh, principles. And I would argue that we need to have these principles in state statute. And what Representative uh, Schultz does is she completely removes principles. And let me tell you what these principles are. So we have a principle that says that you cannot pack or crack minorities. Those are terms that are used commonly in redistricting. So that means you can't create a district that would consolidate all minorities into one area so that they have less representation at the Capitol. You also can't crack a minority population to make it so that they're so spread out that again, they can't have that representation at the Capitol. That's part of the principles that are in my bill that Representative Schultz is removing with her amendment. On top of that, she is removing with her amendment the principle of having communities of interest. And why is that important? Because communities of interest are what help us understand what makes a good district and prevents gerrymandering. The whole idea of principles is to prevent gerrymandering. And here she's stripping them out of the bill. Those are just some of the few things that I have as a problem with what her amendment does. But her amendment also leaves us subject to a commission, which we all have had experience with the Met Council, right? That's its own version of a commission. We think that these folks are going to be nonpartisan, that they're not going to have political views or political agendas. Well, let me tell you, they do. And we have a prime example of that in California. California has their own commission of so-called nonpartisan people that are supposed to be putting together these districts. And then some ambitious reporters decided to dig into this commission to see who are these people that are on this commission. And it was a list of who's who in the Democrat Party. People that served on interest group after interest group with DFL ties, Democrat ties, excuse me, for California. And you know what was even more shocking? They discovered email after email from Democrat lawmakers into those commission members saying, hey, we think you should tweak this boundary right here, or we need this section right here. If you give us this chunk, we'll be able to dominate this part of California. That's your nonpartisan commission. I don't want that coming here in Minnesota. These principles protect against it for any future body that comes forward. Members, vote no on the Representative Schultz's amendment and please support mine. The member from Sherburne, Representative Knobloch. Uh, Mr. Speaker, would Representative Schultz yield to a question? She will yield. Representative Knobloch. Well, Representative Schultz, I'm looking at uh, the Anderson Amendment to the amendment, and I see that, among other things, it strikes Subdivision 7 of your amendment. And so I'm trying to understand how Subdivision 7 works. And uh, page 2, line 27 through 29, 
Subdivision 7 says the Commission shall submit to the Legislature by April 30th of the year ending in 1, redistricting plans for the legislative and congressional seats. Either of these plans may be enacted or rejected by the Legislature, but not modified. It seems to me, Representative Schultz, there's a third option that the Legislature could employ, and that is to do nothing. What happens, Representative Schultz, if the Legislature does nothing? Representative Schultz. If the legislator does nothing, it re reverts to our current state statute, it would go to the courts. Representative Knobloch. Uh, would she yield into another question? She will. Representative Knobloch. Uh, Representative Schultz, where does it say that? Representative Schultz. It doesn't need to say that in this, in this amendment. Representative Knobloch. Well, Mr. Speaker, members, I guess I don't know that this is particularly workable. I mean, we're going to appoint all these people, we're going to pay them money to meet, uh, but if the legislature chooses to ignore their work, nothing happens. Uh, they're just ignored. We can just keep going on doing whatever we want. And in fact, if you go on further looking at uh, uh, page 3, lines 11 and 12, it says the third plan, if we get that far, may be enacted as submitted, rejected, or enacted as modified by the legislature. So if the legislature wants to modify whatever plan this group comes up with, again, we're going to be back to the legislature doing this anyway. But to me, it seems like we're just going to go through all the work of appointing this commission, uh, paying them the per diem, the mileage, uh, whatever they need, but there's no requirement that we pay any attention to anything they do. And so I don't know why we would adopt uh, the A25 amendment. I think it makes sense to delete this language. Uh, vote for the Anderson amendment to the amendment. The member from Dakota, Representative Halverson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to uh, start by thanking Representative Schultz for um, putting in um, some really um, difficult work on trying to solve a problem um, that has vexed this legislator and, and vexed our, our communities for years. And that is, how do we ensure fair and non-partial redistricting when it's time? Um, and the public has been through this many times where we see the DFL map and the GOP map. And I had a friend in the last redistricting who said, oh, I don't even look at those things because um, we know they're going to get thrown out. Um, and so uh, I think the point about wasted time and resources is a good one. We want to be sure that we um, put a, a process into place that the public can look to and count on as being um, nonpartisan um, and fair to the voters. Um, this is about the health of our republic and the, the, the way that the public counts on us to be able to represent them fairly. And there's no way that any political party, I don't care if it's the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, should be able to put their thumb on the scale and pick their own voters. And we have had some very egregious examples for decades in this country, unfortunately, and the problem con continues. The problem continues in the state of Minnesota, in, in, the, in the United States. Um, most recently, we're seeing our neighbors, Wisconsin, um, going through a lawsuit that, that some of their districts were drawn unfairly. Texas and Maryland and North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Maryland, it's on my list. I've got people, I've got the shout out happening. We all know, we've, we've watched this happen. And, and some of the most egregious cases are worse than just partisan redistricting. Um, there's some, been some horrible racial gerrymandering where folks are picking their voters to dilute the voice of communities. That is unconstitutional, that is un-American. We've seen a real startling trend in partisanness in redistricting that um, puts party over people. There's no reason that legislators should be deciding their districts. There's no reason. I, I really do oppose legislators serving on this commission. 
um, because the urge to protect incumbency is so great. And, and I, I've watched it around here where we, we, we debate different laws that really tip the scales away from voters. And um, by having partisan redistricting, we're tipping the scales away from the voters. And we can't do that. We absolutely have to ensure that we, we fight every urge we have to in protect incumbency. That's not our job. Our job is to protect one person, one vote. We have to make sure that every vote counts in this state, and we have to make sure that every voter counts. And by taking partisanship out of the process, we will do a much better job. So thank you, uh, Representative Schultz. I, I support your proposal, and we all should support your proposal. It's the right proposal for the people. Thank you. The member from Ramsey, Representative Moran. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I have the author of the amendment to the amendment um, rise for a question? She Just will so, yield. So I, she you. will yield, Representative Moran. All right, thank you. Just so I can get some clarity around this language. So it states that the commission consists of seven members of the Senate and seven members of the House, um, and um, no more than five from the majority. So could you give me a picture of what that would look like? Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So you would have uh, five members of the majority in the House and five members of the majority in the Senate and two members of the minority in the Senate and two members in the minority in the House. So this is modeled off of what we do on the Pension Commission. Representative Moran. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, gosh. It's a little partisan. <laughs> and I would think that, you know, partisan redistricting really harms the democratic process. Uh, gerrymandering is and should be a bipartisan problem with a bipartisan solution. But that is not done here. Um, Minnesota Democrat, uh, dem demographics are changing every single day, every single year. And our legislative districts should represent the population of the Commonwealth. So drawing district lines in a more equitable manner promotes more competitive elections and results in the elections of leaders more likely to act in the true interest of Minnesota. And political gerrymandering results in, because it's, you know, we can clearly see what's, you know, folks are, are not, you know, they can clearly see what's taking place here. And it really caused people to not even want to come out and vote. So there's lower voter turnout. Increased polarization of legislative bodies and a lack of bipartisan compromise. And it really will promote an increased likelihood of budget and policies deadline, deadlocks. And so, it is really, you have created a very, very partisan process. And Minnesotans expect more of us. Heaven forbid that we put politics into this process any more than we already do in this body. And so I just hope that we can vote this down and do the right thing for the people of Minnesota. The member from Ramsey, Representative Pinto. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, so I think we need to be really clear and just kind of get back to some first principles. I know folks in the chamber know these first couple things I'm going to say, but I want to make sure that the Minnesotans do too. So every 10 years, there's a census, and the lines that are used to, um, to elect us have to be redrawn based on population changes. 
And the way that those lines are drawn can make a really big difference in who gets elected. And you kind of see that, in fact, in this proposal that uh, the proposal is to actually have more people from the majority party uh, as these lines are getting drawn. And that must be because it makes a difference about where these lines get drawn. It can make a really big difference. And in 2018, with great information, uh, or plenty of information, that political parties and others have, there's some really detailed information as far as that line drawing goes, um, such that it is really not an exaggeration to say that the people who are drawing the lines are to some extent um, picking the voters. And uh, I think that uh, uh, it should be pretty obvious then to Minnesotans watching this that the people who are being picked by the voters shouldn't be the people picking the voters. Right? That makes sense. Um, and really, it's a threat to our democracy, to trust in our democracy, when that doesn't happen, when the legislators are, in fact, picking their own voters. We need to be able to trust the process by which each one of us ends up in these seats. And when Minnesotans can't trust that, that's when things get really bad. Right? They need to be able to trust that. And so there's that basic principle. Now, as it turns out, um, I, I think Representative Anderson made a comment about our um, Minnesota, Minnesota doing a good job. As it turns out, in Minnesota, most of the decades, legislators have not been picking their own voters. The courts have actually done that. Um, that's actually been just a happy accident in that we have not been able to agree, or our predecessors have not been able to, it ends up going to the courts. And so there's this process um, whereby the courts end up doing this. I noticed uh, Representative Anderson, even in introducing the, the bill in the first place, talked about the principles, and I think I may have misheard or she may have misspoken, but that the principles guide the courts. And in the past, that has been true. But it is true still that we have this vestige in the law that says that somehow we pick the voters, that we draw the lines, even though, again, we really haven't been doing that. So Representative Schultz is proposing that we finally have happened what Minnesotans presumably would want to happen if you talk to them, which is that we don't pick our own voters. We don't draw our own lines. Just a basic concept. She's saying, let's go with that. Let's establish an independent commission. You may have noticed retired judges, citizens, certainly not us. Let's stop having legislators pick their own voters. So now this amendment we're about to vote on from Representative Anderson reverses that. And it's a commission that consists entirely of legislators. Now that should seem problematic, but the second thing is it's not just legislators picking their voters, it's also, as Representative Rand pointed out, the great majority from, from the majority party. Five of the seven coming from the, from the majority. So a little more context as well for Minnesotans. A few years ago, there was a proposal to have legislators stop setting their own salaries. There was a constitutional amendment that um, folks may remember, may be surprising to some people watching this, knowing that in fact, yeah, as of pretty recently, legislators actually set their own salaries. There was a vote on that, and, uh, and uh, I believe I was not here at the time, that actually many in the Republican majority, now majority, in fact opposed that. Well, Minnesotans disagreed. We have a constitutional amendment so that we do not set our own salaries. Good thing. Then a few minutes ago, we had a vote as to whether we should disclose who pays for our trips. Not whether we took the trip and where we went, maybe we are, maybe folks are uh, having uh, releases about that, but actually describing who pays for the trip. Again, we saw the vote on that. And once again, Democrats saying, yep, we should not be setting our own salaries, we should be letting voters know, uh, letting the public know who pays for our trips. And we saw that vote as well. Now, I want to point out all these things apply equally to both sides. It shouldn't be that one side sets her salaries and the other one does it based on uh, independent commission. One side discloses the trip, the other doesn't. No, this applies equally to both sides. And this too, an independent commission where we're not drawing our own lines. The principles of redistricting, Representative Anderson referred to a number of times, but there's one principle above all else I think that Minnesotans would agree with, which is we should not be picking our own voters. When you apply for a job, you shouldn't be hiring yourself, right? <laughs> Somebody else should do that. Elected officials should not draw their own lines. Voters should choose their legislators. So this is really a good opportunity for us to show that we understand that, to show that it is not our job to draw our lines to pick our voters. It's their job. We work for them and not the other way around. Members, I urge you to vote down this amendment. Let's support the Schultz Amendment. Let's have an independent group doing this work. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member from Ramsey, Representative Mahoney. Mr. Speaker, I apologize. This debate's gone on so long, I forgot what I was going to say. 
The member from Hennepin, Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have not forgotten what I was going to say. Um, <clears throat> you know, in the introduction of the amendment to the amendment or the discussion on it, it says that there's no principles in this uh, amendment offered by Representative Schultz. And I just want people to refer to line 2.17, where it talks about actually redistricting principles that would actually be established by the commission after having public hearings and discussions about this. So, so there will be principles. But I actually want to speak to a simple math issue. And when I look at the amendment to the amendment officered by Representative Anderson, there's seven members of the Senate appointed by the subcommittee. No more than five members from each body. So there's a total of 14 members, and this is supposed to be so that this is really fair and there's no bar bipartisanship involved, but 10 of those members would be from the majority party. So I think in some ways it can be disingenuous to say that this is going to be something that's nonpartisan, but yet we allow 10 of the 14 members to be from one party. And I also want to remind members in this body that there's two more elections before this takes place. And as a Democrat, this scares me. Not because I believe the Republicans would be uh, in the majority in both these bodies, but the Democrats might be in the majority of both these bodies. And I don't think it's incumbent upon us as a DFL party in the majority to be deciding where these lines go. So this is not an amendment by Representative Schultz to put any advantage to the majority party, but I actually think the amendment to the amendment does exactly that. It puts actually the power within the majority to determine how the lines should be drawn. And with that, members, I would request that you would have a no vote on the amendment to the amendment. The member from Hennepin, Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, all of you should have in your desks this little blue book. It is the Minnesota Constitution. And if you look in the Minnesota Constitution, it says the responsibility of redrawing district lines is that of this body and the entire legislature. Not some independent commission, but us. It is our responsibility. This is your constitution. So we're not talking about something that's just changing something in the statute books. We're talking about she wants to change our state constitution. There's a reason that the founders said that the legislature should be responsible for this. Independent commission. Many of you said independent. I laugh at the word independent. I sent to all of you an article about the oh so ever independent uh, commission in California. It was so independent that they invented groups to speak on behalf of the Democrat plan. They just made them up. So we're, today we're going to create this group. You're going to go and testify before this independent commission and tell them what a great plan that Democrat plan is. Wow, that's independent. They had people just make up who they were to testify in favor of their plan. Just made it up. When they got done with their plan, they were so proud of themselves for, you know, basically bilking the system. They patted themselves on the back and sent out memos. Isn't this great? They were expected to only pick up two seats. Then they said, we'll be able to pick up six to seven seats now with their independent commission. If you think that you're going to get something better with an independent commission that can be thwarted and corrupted by these so-called made-up groups, with emails being funneled in from the Democrat Party. I got another thing coming for you. I'll send you some uh, swamp land. Also, folks, Minnesota has a backup plan already. If things don't go well, we do have a court. 
that does the lines. And here's what the problem is with the courts in drawing the lines. In the last two redistricting cycles, the court has only used the mapping data that they have before them. And you know what that has resulted in? Edina. In the city of Edina, they happen to have a senior housing complex that down the middle of that complex, the census block divides it. So on one side of the hallway, the people vote in one district. On the other side of the hallway, they vote in, the, in a different district. So the court has made this mistake not once, but twice despite the fact that the city has gone to the extra length of saying, hey, by the way, don't make this mistake because you can't draw the line here. You are dividing a physical building in half. So you know what the legislature's had to do? Every year we have to come back then and we have to fix this. Because you know what? Other groups outside of us don't know our districts better than we do. All of us know our districts better than anybody else in the state probably because we walk them physically, or we drive every single township road that there is under the sun. We are the experts in the map of the state of Minnesota. You couldn't find a better people to draw the maps. Let me highlight another problem. This happened in the last go around. City of Brainerd, the courts neglected, they left out two parcels of land that was basically surrounded by water. These folks couldn't get to their, where they needed to vote. They had to travel through another legislative district to get to where they needed to travel to vote because the courts forgot them. They were left out. So we had to go and fix it. But we knew better because you know what? We door knock on those doors. We know those people. We know the territory. We are the experts on maps of the state of Minnesota and handing it to an independent commission that is ripe for corruption is not the route to go. Appreciate your support on my amendment, folks. The member from Dakota, Representative May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Anderson, I'm glad you brought up the Constitution. The Constitution is a living, breathing document. I am proof of that, and here's why. We change our Constitution when we realize that what is in it is not working for us. There is not a single citizen, there is a, not a single citizen who wants us to draw our own districts. Nobody wants that. We do know our districts very well, and that is why it's problematic. An independent commission is not a court, leaving out parcels, leaving out lakes, or drawing down through a building. That's what an independent commission is for, to talk to the public, to be nonpartisan. We have states all over the nation that have their maps being redrawn because their legislatures have gerrymandered them over and over and over again, ruled by the Supreme Court, redraw your, redraw your districts because they're gerrymandered. This should not be in our hands. This should be in an independent commission, and I thank Representative Schultz for bringing this to us, because this is what our citizens are asking us to do, to not continue to decide who we are going to represent. They decide who represents them. People are gonna to continue to not have faith in democracy if we continue to do things like this. The last thing I'll say is, you brought up the Constitution and, and this role being here, and that's ironic being that we're talking about the egg, enviro, uh, state government, finance, and whatever the fourth bill is in this omnibus bill under the single subject rule. We can't pick and choose when we're gonna follow things. This should be in the hands of the people, it should be in the hands of an independent commission, and I urge you to vote no on the amendment to the amendment and yes to the amendment. The member from Anoka, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I don't speak a lot on the House floor, but this is a really troublesome conversation to me. Um, you know, I've been here for 10 years, and it's only been since the last election that I've heard that there's any problems with, with redistricting and who is in charge of it. Never heard it. 10 years, 10 years I've been here. And that seems fairly um, odd to me, but yet 
I think I may be on to something as to why that might be. And you can probably draw your own conclusions on that. I'm glad Representative Anderson is being proactive and she's put these, um, into, is attempting to put these principles into statute. It's something that hasn't been done before. I think it needs to be done. And which one of these principles um, is so problematic for y'all? Is it nesting, equal population, contiguity, compactness, numbering, minority representation, minority civil divisions, preserving communities of interest, and then going into the data that should be used and the consideration of the plans, et cetera. Which, which one of these is so problematic that we can't adopt them the way they are and we think we need a commission to especially do this? I don't know, um, Representative Anderson, when, um, when if the, uh, the requirement that the legislature do the redistricting, I don't know when that was put in our Constitution, if that was part of the original piece or not. I, you know, we just celebrated, what was 150 years of statehood recently? Um, so I think it's been going on a very, very long time. I haven't seen national news that Minnesota is really messed up when it comes to where our district lines are drawn. So let's not find, let's not be, you know, searching for a problem here when one does not exist. And people are saying that we shouldn't be able to pick our own voters. I, I don't think that's happening. I don't, if that was the case, I don't know why I go out and door knock every um, election cycle. I don't know why so many of us go out and door knock every election cycle if, if we've got it in the bag and all of our constituents are, you know, in the bag for us. So members, I, I want to thank Representative Anderson for being, having the foresight to put into statute something that regardless of who is in the majority, they'll have principles to guide them. And Representative Dean Ray, um, five to two, whatever, the Democrats could be in charge of the Senate and we could be in charge and the Republicans could be in, part, in charge of the um, House. So it's not like it's going to be 10 to 2, Democrat versus Republican, necessarily. Things shift around here quite a bit, except for the Senate, actually, really. It's very unusual that, that, the, um, that, the, that the Senate is in um, Republican hands. It hasn't happened a lot in history. So, folks, I think this is, this is I, again, I want to thank Representative Anderson for having the foresight to put these principles in here. And let's not go searching for a problem where one doesn't exist in our wonderful state. The member from Hennepin, Minority Leader, Majority Leader Pepin. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative Schultz, the author of the underlying amendment, yield to a question? She will. Representative Pepin. Th thanks. Um, Representative Schultz, it sounds like one of the big concerns is the partisanship that comes in. Would you say that's one of the main goals of your amendment, is to, to relieve partisanship? Representative Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's to be more transparent. We don't know what the future holds for us. We don't know who's going to be in control. The reason why Minnesota isn't as gerrymandered as other states is because it goes to the courts. That's why if one party controls the executive and legislative branch, we will look like Pennsylvania and other states. It will cost a lot of money, millions of dollars in litigation. We don't know what will happen. We need to make sure that it doesn't happen. This is preventive. We don't know who's going to win in the next election, who's going to be in the majority. And that's why it's paramount to do it now. This is so important to the democracy of our state, to protecting individuals. We need to do something now to prevent bad things from happening. That's why I'm bringing it forward. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, Representative Schultz. Well, I guess, Representative Schultz, I'm a little confused by the, um, what you're trying to do in the underlying amendment. You want to bring transparency forward. And I understand your first part where you're having someone, you're trying to make it even, so you have a minority and a majority member from each party to appoint someone on this. But the second part is kind of confusing to me. When you look at the, when you look at this, when you look at the second part of the, um, the appointments, starting on line 1.19, you have the LCC appointing four members. Well, Representative Schultz, if you did that today, your result would be two Republicans and two Democrats that are appointed, 
and then the additional judge they would appoint would be, could be either. But then you're, the Republicans would pick the other four. So if you did this now, you'd actually have it in more partisan hands, and uh, that doesn't seem like that does anything to fix your problem, except for you're sort of washing your hands of it and having this outside group when you're asking them to do the work. So um, Representative Dean talked about the partisanship of it and that we needed to make sure that that doesn't happen. Your amendment does absolutely nothing. If that's the true problem you feel that we have, this does absolutely nothing to fix that because uh, right now it would be Republicans picking, and if the parties changed or, or, or flipped, then it could possibly be just the Democrats. So uh, the only difference is there's accountability when legislators are actually picking it, and that's why it is in the Constitution. And so I think if the idea is to change the Constitution, that's another discussion, and that, that should, would need to go on the ballot. But um, right now, we are the ones held accountable for redistricting, and you're, um, I, under, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but this not only makes it less transparent, it doesn't fix anything. Uh, it doesn't fix the partisanship issue in any way whatsoever. So members, I would encourage you to vote for the Anderson Amendment and against the Schultz. Uh, the member from St. Louis, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I begin my discussion, I would ask for a roll call on the secondary amendment. A roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Schultz. So first of all, uh, five retired judges I would not consider corrupt, as language was used earlier. Uh, they will be um, bipartisan. And the four uh, community members are picked by the LCC, the Legislative Coordinating Commission. But you still need a majority of that entire commission to make decisions. So I feel it's much more bipartisan than the current process is. And, and it doesn't change our Constitution. This goes back to the legislature. The commission's maps goes back to the legislature, even though we may need to change our Constitution to protect our democracy. And it should go to the voters. If we can, as a body, decide, this question should be put to the voters to decide whether we need an independent commission and let them decide. Also, they can still vote us out of office because we're ultimately the people that are going to decide. But it makes the process more transparent. They're going to go out to the public and share the maps and get input. So it makes it more transparent, which is what we're, we don't have today. Um, there are 40 bills in 17 states right now on creating independent commissions. This is not a new idea. It's been around since the 1960s. And Minnesota is not California. This is not the same type of commission that's operating in California. This is a commission of retired judges who never had any partisan career or lobbying. So I urge people to vote no on Representative Anderson's amendment. The member from Ramsey, Representative Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in opposition to the amendment to the amendment. Several, several things drive me in this area. Number one is I hear from, while some people say they've not heard from a lot of people on this, I've heard from people on this issue for many years. And where this dates back to is many decades ago, well, not, not as many as I think maybe, but when Governor Carlson was uh, governor here, at that time the DFL controlled both chambers. They put forward a map that was approved and that was terribly gerrymandered at the time. And the reason it stuck out, even though I'm a Democrat, I did not like the map that was put out there because it was being too political. And one of the things that it did is it severely divided the community that I was in. The community that I'm in, uh, Maplewood at the time, we had only about 30,000 people, but at the time we were carved into five different house districts as people were trying to gerrymander for power. So part of the reason that I'm against having us doing it is because the temptation of gerrymandering for power, power is terribly corrupting is just too great, and when it's happened in the past, it's been used, and it's been used by both parties. Uh, when we've had, uh, I've heard the concerns uh, represented, uh, from Representative Anderson about input in the process. I know that here in the state, the last time the judges were doing it, they took input from people across the state. You could file your comments, and those comments were listened to, and that's something that you want to make sure that you have in an, in an open process. Um, one of the concerns I have with the huge concerns I have with the amendment to amend besides us being the one still doing it is the fact that we have an imbalance there. We do not have 
an equal balance of power there. And any time you have inequity, the temptation by the majority to do something that benefits them is too great. And as a result, that amendment does, your amendment, uh, uh, Representative Anderson, uh, does not solve that problem. It causes that to continue out there. Uh, we are much better off going into an independent course. The people in my district have strongly supported that. I know that when I've listened to this subject being discussed by the League of Women Voters, they've come up with proposals along that same line, saying that we're much better off having a more transparent and independent group doing it. As a result, we may need to change the Constitution at some point, but until we get there, I appreciate the uh, direction that uh, Representative Schultz is going and support her underlying amendment. The member from Olmsted, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to raise a couple of points that I don't think have been raised. I've been listening carefully to the um, debate, and there has been a question raised about whether the Constitution allows us to do this. And I looked at my Constitution, which I do refer to often. It's quite marked up, this little blue book in my desk. And I think that Representative Anderson is probably talking about Article 4, Section 3, which refers, which, of which the title is Census Enumeration Apportionment, Congressional and Legislative District Boundaries, Senate Districts. It says in this part of the Constitution that the legislature shall have the power to prescribe the bounds of congressional and legislative districts. Shall have the power. Now, there may be case law on this, I don't know. But looking at the words of the Constitution and looking at what's happened, certainly the last time we did redistricting, I believe the time before when it went to the courts, the fact that it says shall have the power does not say the only way this can be done is for the legislature to do it itself. So I do believe that this Constitution Unless somebody shows me case law to the contrary, I think this gives us the power to decide that it will be done in a certain way and not necessarily to do it ourselves. And if this absolutely means that the legislature is the only body that can decide, then something wrong's been going on with the courts doing it because that is the way it's ultimately been done. So I, I wanted to make that point. I also wanted to respond to Representative Scott who is asking what, which one of these principles is problematic. And indeed, some of them come right out of the Constitution. That is sure. But I'll tell you the one that gives me pause. That's on line 230.13, where it says, nothing in this subdivision prohibits the use of additional data as determined by the legislature. Talk about overbroad. That sure is overbroad. So what does that mean? What additional data could the legislature, who, and let's, let's be honest here. When we say the legislature, we mean whoever's in the majority. That's the way things work. So what data could the, could the majority in power at that time determine they want to use? Well, I don't see anything here that stops anybody from looking at how the, um, who the incumbent is, where they live, you know what the voting history of that those people has been, et cetera. Now, I don't know if that was the intent, but I think this puts a pretty darn big hole in the principles that are being passed here, and that makes me very nervous. You know, we've got two things going on here. One is the way this is actually going to work. The other is that we need to... And, and the transparency that Representative Schultz keeps referring to. But there's also something about the appearance of fairness. You know, we should be fair, but we also have to have something that people can look at and feel confident in. And when we have language in a bill that says that the legislature can use whatever additional data it wants to, I don't think that is a very good set of principles. Thank you. The member from Hennepin, Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to respond to a couple of things that were said here. Um, first, I want to address what Representative uh, Fisher commented on. Many people who have never looked at a map of the entire state 
uh, know the fact that maple wood has a very odd shape. It's about this skinny, travels up like this, and then goes like this as a hook. It is basically a backwards hook. And when you're drawing maps, it makes it very challenging to keep that shape of a community together and then not impact all the other uh, communities next to it. I'm going to highlight another city that has problems with that. That's the city of Crystal and Representative Lynn Carlson's territory. Crystal actually has a piece, a neighborhood, that's not even connected to the rest of the city. It's like an island. So you have city of Crystal over here, and then you have this little island of Winnetka Hills over here, not even connected to the rest of the city. So you can't even draw a map that would include the entire city of uh, Crystal um, without impacting another community. So is that gerrymandering? No, it's not. These are the realities that you're dealing with when you're drawing a map. I want to address what Representative Schultz mentioned on retired judges. So we just had a new judge put in place, the former Speaker of the House, Paul Thiessen. Would he be considered nonpartisan as a retired judge? He'd certainly be eligible, right? Because there's no requirement here that says. So you would have a former Speaker of the House potentially serving on this commission who raised money for the Democrat Party year after year when he was Speaker of the House. He campaigned against Republican candidates throughout the state of Minnesota. Heck, he even ran for governor, lambasting all Republicans across the state of Minnesota. And he's going to be in charge of our independent commission? How about the other four people that are going to be appointed? I can't think of a single citizen that is nonpartisan. I think that term is just ridiculous. There's not a single person out there that's nonpartisan. Everybody has political views. Everybody has a political ideology. So to think that you're going to have something that is going to be pure as snow, that is not going to be happening. And clearly, California is a prime example where this does not work. They used the system, they corrupted it, and they made it exactly the opposite of what you purport it would do. For Representative Liebling, when she was talking about the Minnesota Constitution and whether there's been case law, there has been case law. In Duxbury versus Donovan in 1965, it said it is the responsibility of the legislature to create the plan, pass the plan, and give it to the governor for his signature. That is case law. So that is the responsibility of our body. Then when it comes to the data, all these districts that I just highlighted to you, the city of Crystal, city of Maplewood, talking about Brainerd, talking about Edina, all of that is additional data that you don't get as part of the census block data that is provided to you by the federal government. If you don't include that kind of data when you're putting together the maps, you're going to have the exact same problems that you had in the last two cycles of redistricting. You need to have that additional data to make smart redistricting plans. That's why we're doing it. Members, I um, encourage you to vote for my amendment, and I appreciate your patience on this issue. Thank you. A roll call being requested. The clerk will take the roll on the A51 amendment. Omar votes nay. Clerk will close the roll. There being 74 ayes and 49 nays, the A51 amendment is adopted. 
Members, we return to the underlying amendment, the A25, for the discussion. Member from St. Louis, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to address the last point that Representative Anderson was making. Representative Paul Thiessen would not be eligible in the language of my amendment, lines 1.10, an individual who has served in a party designated or party endorsed position, such as legislator, or who is a current registered lobbyist is not eligible to be appointed to the commission. And that's true also of um, pub the public. And I use the word bipartisan, not nonpartisan. So this is, is trying to take the politics as much as we can out of the process. That's what my amendment is trying to do. And of having retired judges sit on the commission is um, supported in a bipartisan way. It was first brought forward by Vice President Walter Mondale, former Governor Al Qui, former Governor Arnie Carlson, Representative Steve Swigum, Representative Roger Moe. So this has had bipartisan support, the idea of this type of commission of retired judges. And the simple point is, we should not be drawing the districts. Elected officials should not be drawing the districts. We should let voters decide. We should let the public have input. We should make it more transparent. They elect us. We represent them. And I, I'm going to withdraw my amendment. Representative Schultz withdraws the A25 amendment. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker. Member from Ramsey, Representative M Pinto. Mr. Speaker, I rise to a point of personal privilege. State your personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, members, uh, I'm a member of the Democratic Farmer Labor Party, or DFL, um, and I want to wait till after the vote on this, but I've heard a number of times my party referred to as the Democrat Party. I am a Democrat, uh, but uh, I respectfully request that my party be referred to by Democratic Farmer Labor, DFL. If you really want to say Democratic, you can, although I'm real proud of the Farmer Labor part of my party's name, but I prefer the party be referred to by its proper name rather than the Democrat Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Belay well, moves to amend Senate File Number 3656. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A4. Recognize the member from Rice, Representative Bly, to your amendment. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, this, this amendment is to the Energy Bill, uh, and it uh, refers to um, energy storage. Before I start in on that, I, I actually was standing up at the same time uh, Representative Pinto was, and, and he beat me to it. So I, I also wanted to raise a, the, kind of the same issue. Um, and I know sometimes we have fun with each other and fun with our names. Uh, earlier, another representative said we might be the L, L might stand for lawyer or whatever. We like to tease each other. Um, you know, Harry Truman, a former uh, president, uh, irritated by hearing uh, Republicans call his party the Democrat Party, the Democrat Party, said, um, you know, from now on I'm going to call you the Republican Party. Republican Party. <laughs> Some people would say you should be the Republican Party, but, you know, we have fun with these things. Um, I also was, at different times, I was going to stand up and talk about the Farmer Labor Party. You know, it's not really a party that was necessarily supposed to represent the interests of farmers or necessarily the interests of laborers. It was a party on its own, the Farmer Labor Party. And um, they were an anti-corporate, anti-big bank party. And uh, I actually have a bill that I'd never gotten a hearing on, and I was going to ask at one Mr. point. Mr. Speaker, uh, point of order. Representative Krisha. What order of business are, on, are we on, Mr. Speaker? Representative Krisha, we are on the A4 amendment. <laughs> Representative Bly. Yes. I apologize, Representative Krisha. I was just trying to have a little bit of humor. Um, <laughs> I wasn't trying to make trouble. Anyway. Uh, I think that my amendment also is in the spirit of bipartisanship. 
And I think there's support on both sides of the aisle for uh, looking at energy storage. Energy storage is um, a phenomenon that's happening faster than I think we can keep up with. Uh, prices are declining, and uh, there's, the technology is out there in front of us, and I think it's, uh, it's pertinent for us to be asking uh, utilities and, and others to be looking at energy storage. We as a body should be looking at it and, and figuring out how we're going to uh, encourage it, how, what we're going to do about how it gets uh, implemented and used. Um, I, um, I had the pleasure of uh, going on the Legislative Energy Commission's trip to San Francisco with some other uh, bipartisan members of this body, and, and um, we, uh, we visited um, the Berkeley Energy Lab, and uh, we also uh, visited uh, the Tesla factory. And uh, they're doing a lot of work with batteries and energy storage. And uh, I think the time is coming when we will be relying on energy storage as a provider of energy. And uh, again, I think we need to look at that. Um, I also uh, had conversation with some folks who are working on a bill for uh, energy storage and, and, and its impact on renewable uh, sources of energy. And I'd like to yield to uh, Representative Rarick to say some comments about what's going on with that. Representative Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Bly. Uh, members, um, I've been working closely this session with some groups in the storage industry, um, and they've been negotiating a lot with uh, our Excel and the other uh, members of our community uh, providing our power. Um, this is something that uh, I really found intriguing because these energy storage companies were not coming looking for a mandate or any special treatment. They want to be involved um, in the process to show that they are a method that can make energy more affordable. I think that's something we're all looking for um, is that cleaner and cheaper energy for all Minnesotans and energy storage is going to be a key component in that going forward. Um, they are getting very, very close in their negotiations, um, and I'm hoping there's a potential we can still get to it yet this year. And so um, I hope we can continue on that process and get that because the parties are very, very close to an agreement on this language. Representative Bly. Thank you, Speaker. So uh, in that spirit, real, not realizing, it's been a while actually since I served on the Energy Committee, and I'm, I am, I have to admit, a little bit out of touch of, uh, with all the conversations going on. But uh, when I introduced this amendment, I did not know uh, that they were getting so close to having an agreement, and I don't want to interfere with that. So I will withdraw my amendment. Representative Bly withdraws the A4 amendment. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Anderson S. moves to amend Senate file number 3656. The second engrossment as amended, and the amendment is coded A13. I call upon the member from Hennepin, Representative Anderson S., to your amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, members, I read in the newspaper, this is actually a Representative Jim Davney's uh, initiative. I read in the paper this Sunday an article highlighting that in some homes, uh, in the metro area I know at least, and maybe in other areas, there are covenants placed on the home that you can't sell your home to certain minority groups, whether that's um, African Americans, in some cases um, there's anti-Semitism as well. And when I read the article, Quite honestly, I was shocked by it and disappointed by it and uh, wanted to advocate for the legislation that Representative Dabney has put forward. And I, I just want to give you one example that a friend of mine sent to me, um, if you'll bear with me. I'm trying to get this up. Where it says, in this covenant, it says, no person of any race other than the Aryan race shall use or occupy any building uh, or any lot. I, to me, that I just I can't imagine that, and so um, just ask that you support this amendment, and I'd like to yield to Representative Dabney since he's worked hard on this as well. He will yield, Representative Dabney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and Representative Anderson. Thank you for bringing this amendment forward. I also want to acknowledge uh, Chair Scott for having given this uh, proposal an informational 
uh, hearing 10 days ago or so. Uh, Representative Anderson is, is absolutely right. If you dig into some of the abstract titles uh, in the state, it is shocking what you find. There's an organization in Minneapolis called the Mapping Prejudice Project. Uh, these folks are, are primarily historians, although they've got a uh, wicked smart geographer uh, working with them who are looking at every title to every property in the city of Minneapolis initially and now expanding out to Hennepin County to identify these racially restrictive covenants. Uh, when This is part of a national conversation. There's been similar conversation in, in Seattle and in Wyoming and uh, California and elsewhere on these titles, but Minneapolis will be the first city in the country to map every land, every, every parcel, and identify the racially restrictive covenants on them. The covenants are no longer uh, valid. They no longer have any legal uh, authority. However, there is a moral injury to discover that this language uh, formally covered your property. The amendment that Representative Anderson uh, has developed from House File 2767 provides an opportunity for landowners to inexpensively and simply discharge this, uh, the, the, the covenants on their land without having to go to an expensive court process. Uh, there's an ongoing conversation to have uh, about how we both maintain these uh, covenants in the, the abstracts so that it's a simple and easy process and inexpensive, but also retain uh, this ugly splotch on our history uh, in, the, in the Twin Cities and across the state uh, so that future historians and future Minnesotans can understand uh, the roots of some of the challenges that we have around race. I join Representative Anderson in asking for an affirmative uh, vote on this amendment and look forward to working with her on polishing this language as we go forward. Thank you. The member from Ramsey, Representative Lesh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would uh, Representative Davney yield to a question? He will yield. Representative Lesh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, uh, and thank you for that explanation, Representative Davney. Thank you for bringing the amendment, uh, Representative Anderson. This went through committee last week, civil law, and it was informational, but I found it uh, interesting. The question I have related to the legal effect of this procedure that would discharge the covenant. And, you know, as a lawyer, normally you, you never ask a question you don't already know the answer to, but I, I actually don't know the answer to this one. And based on how the legality of these covenants um, was, uh, I guess, done away with, a series of court cases, including United States Supreme Court cases, um, about 50, 60 years ago, these covenants were obviously at one time legal, and they only became illegal by operation of, of court holding. Uh, now, of course, uh, the prevailing opinion among, I would expect, both sides of the aisle is that covenants like these are offensive to our principles, regardless of what a court would say. However, uh, in our grandparents' time, that was not true at all. It was the way you did business. So I guess what I'm wondering is uh, if the courts were to flip back, uh, and it's everyone's assumption that we always move forward uh, in progress in history, and I think history will show that that's not true, it's more cyclical. So if the courts were to flip back uh, and say these covenants were not legal, what legal effect would this procedure have on discharging the legality of those covenants? Would they revert again to becoming legal, or would there be some way where uh, the discharge of the covenant became permanent at the time uh, that the new owners uh, executed it? Representative Dabney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Lesh, uh, you're asking, I believe, a very technical legal question. Uh, and I do not have the legal background to be able to answer uh, in the same 
vein, what I can tell you is that uh, we worked in developing the language that is now the A13 Amendment with the uh, representatives from the Bar Association, uh, the Register of Deeds, the Title Association, a number of the real property groups that would uh, be interested in this. And the uh, language that you see before you uh, reflects some changes that they would requested in, uh, against earlier drafts. I think we will have continuing conversations should this uh, amendment move forward and we may be able to get to some of the concerns that you raised. Representative Lesh. Well, thank you for that. Um, Representative Damney, I didn't mean to throw you under the bus. Uh, considering the history of questioning today, there's been plenty of uh, uh, non-lawyers asking other non-lawyers legal questions, so I thought I'd join that, that club. But um, I do think it's important, uh, members, that uh, it's not as though uh, these covenants are gone. We've outgrown them and think anyone who's, who devised them in the past are, are petty. Uh, and little. Uh, one need look no further than the uh, current state of immigration debate to know that, that some folks still think that some people are better than others. And we may regress to that again in our history. So I hope that, that this amendment uh, uh, that you propose, uh, Representative Anderson, succeeds, um, and as well that we never turn back on this issue. Thank you. Representative Garofalo. Mr. Speaker, I endorse the amendment and ask members to support it. Further discussion? Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. And <clears throat> I'm on the Civil Law Committee, and I had the opportunity to hear this. Thank you, Representative Dabney, for bringing this. And it was eye-opening, and particularly eye-opening for me because one of my dear sweet nephews um, is married to an African-American woman, and they lived in North Minneapolis for quite some time, and uh, they it just breaks my heart to think that at some point, probably the very house that they lived in had that covenant. And you know, members, words have meaning. And you know, sometimes we just need to take a look and say, we need to just remove this from the statute. Representative Anderson, thank you for bringing this forward. And I'm, I'm getting a little emotional because I just, it's so upsetting to think that this is still a remnant um, you know, in our laws. And so I, I'd love to, for us to just remove this today. And uh, thank you so much for moving this forward. Thank you, Representative Dabney, for bringing this conversation forward. And I hope that we can move forward and um, be united in this as we take this vote today. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A13 amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. A13 amendment is adopted. <coughs> there is another amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the <coughs> amendment. Eklund moves to amend Senate file number 3656. The second engrossment as amended, and the amendment is coded A17. I recognize the member from Kuchiching, Representative Eklund, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, about three weeks ago, I uh, received notice that a plant in uh, International Falls in Cushing County was shutting down. It's uh, been in operation oh, probably over, well over 100 years, but it was uh, reorganized in the 1980s, and uh, it's called Orsi. It makes a product called Insulated Building Product. Well, those members who were laid off uh, earlier in the winter, uh, seasonal layoff, which usually happens, and then with the snow that we had, uh, part of the roof collapsed on the, on the building, and the company elected not to reopen. So I'm asking for an extension for those 50 employees uh, of unemployment of 13 weeks. Most of them have worked at that plant since it opened in the middle 80s. So they're, uh, they're looking at retirement. And I've talked to Deed, and I've talked to the uh, work for, uh, 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 workforce group, it's most likely they're not going to qualify for TAA because there's a, de a demand for that product, so the Trade Adjustment Act won't work for them. So I'm just asking for this 13-week uh, week extension. I hope the members will grant it. Thank you. Discussion. Member from Dakota, Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Eklund, thank you for briefing me on this matter before the vote. Uh, this is a unique situation, and I'm happy to address this in conference. I ask members to support it. Further discussion to the A-17 amendment. Seeing none, all those in favor of adoption of the A-17 amendment signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, no. 
Motion prevails. The A-17 amendment is adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Sundin moves to amend Senate file number 3656. The second of Grossman has amended. The amendment is coded A-19. Rep recognize the member from Carleton, Representative Sundin, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, if uh, you want to follow along on page uh, 168 through 169, you'll uh, take a look at uh, article, uh, excuse me, article 8, uh, section 1 of this bill. Uh, I find uh, a lot of this language here vague, um, unnecessary, and actually uh, somewhat meddlesome uh, uh, regarding the building codes, uh, formulation of building codes here in Minnesota. And uh, I can only assume that uh, someone is uh, taking a swing at the Department of Labor and Industry uh, for their uh, code uh, enforcement here, and I don't know exactly why, but uh, uh, the, the bill actually reads, an agency must determine if implementation of a proposed rule or any portion of a proposed rule will on average increase the cost of a residential construction project by re uh, or remodeling by $1,000 or more per unit, and whether the proposed rule meets the state regulatory policy objectives described in section 14.002. In calculating the cost of implementing the proposed rule, the agency may consider the impact of other related proposed rules on the overall cost of the residential construction. This leads to uh, some ambiguity on how they're going to implement a proposed rule. They may or may not uh, conversely, they may not uh, consider the impact of other related proposed rules. I don't know what other proposed rules uh, they would be referring to, but they may or may not look at them. Also, uh, uh, referring to the ambiguity of this uh, language, uh, the, if the agency determines the impact of a proposed rule meets or exceeds the cost threshold, provided in subdivision two, or if the administrative law judge separately confirms the cost of any portion of a rule, if of any portion of a rule exceeds the cost threshold. So th this puts us uh, in the, d these determinations of, uh, of uh, how this is applied, but it hands some of the responsibility to the agency and actually some of the responsibility to the administrative law judge doesn't uh, separate how that happens. And then further on it goes, any portion of a rule exceeds the cost threshold provided in subdivision two of a new or old. Uh, we're referring to new and or uh, old rules. So I don't know if this applies to old rules. That, uh, are we going to look back on uh, previous code uh, that's been implemented, or uh, are we going to uh, just go forward on new? I don't know. This is a very, very uh, unclear language, uh, if, you, if you look closely at it. Uh, there again, I, I mentioned it, this is unnecessary as well. This is unnecessary. We've got uh, a, a good uh, coding system in place every six years. Uh, the new recommendations come forward, and uh, we have new construction codes. This uh, system is supported by 24 in individual uh, organizations from the American Institute of Architects, the Association of Minnesota Building Associations, Elevator Constructors, Fire Marshals, Minnesota Building and Construction Trades Council, the Minnesota Drywall and Plasters Association, the Pipe Trades Association, Fire Chiefs, National Electrical Contractors, Sheet Metal Air Conditioning and Roofing Contractors, There's, and several more. So. This is a system that has been working quite well uh, for quite some time. And uh, to shift some of the uh, responsibility out of the hands of the uh, agency uh, and uh, give legislative oversight uh, to these um, codes and final approval to the legislature, I think is actually very, very wrong-headed. We're not very good at it tell you the truth. We had uh, one provision here that came forward three years ago that we looked at, and we looked at it again last year, and we looked at it again this year. It took three years to pass Sophie's Law, and it's just simply a, a device that uh, had to go into a, uh, houseboats or, 
or uh, contained areas. So we don't have a very good record here in the legislature of uh, uh, meddling with uh, codes and uh, public safety uh, when we've got an agency that's doing a good job already. So I urge support of this amendment, and uh, we can strip out Section 1 of this uh, Article 8. Thank you. I recognize the member from Scott, Representative Vogel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, fellow members, the intent of this is, first of all, we, we have to look at the affordability of housing. Um, it's estimated right now that up to 25% of the cost of a new house is in some type of form, uh, regulation or fee. Now, I recognize that the state isn't completely responsible for all of those, but we are responsible for what we can do. And that's the intent behind here, is to bring affordability back to housing. Uh, it, it used to be that you could get into them. When I first bought our house, we bought a little house. We were able to move in, do some remodeling, turn it, and build a bigger house that we needed for our family. It's nearly impossible to do that anymore. You can't get in, and, and a big reason is because we've got 20 to 30 percent of the cost of a new house going into regulation, which is why I've looked at this and I put forward the bill that actually became part of this section. I also think that we have to look at the cumulative nature of regulation. $1,000 may not sound like a lot of money, although it is important to remember that it's estimated that for every $1,000 in the cost of a house goes up, it takes three to 4,000 pe people out of, or families out of the mortgage market because of qualification. So it's not an insignificant amount, even though it's, meant, uh, it's been said that sometimes it is. The other intent here is what I call silo breaking. Right now, it isn't just the uh, Department of Labor and Industry that's looking at building codes. We've got energy standards. Um, we, we've got safety standards. We've got stormwater standards. And, and the agencies, when we had this in committee, did say that they're really not talking to each other and trying to keep the costs down. What this bill does, and the enhancement that was made from last session when we, actually, we talked to us on the floor, was that this is the net effect. So therefore, if it's de determined that there has to be a $25 or $3,500 increase in regulation due to safety it, or energy, it doesn't preclude the agencies from getting together and taking something out of regulation that's already there. Again, remembering that this is driving the cost of housing. That's what we're looking at here. So the intent is to drive a little creativity. Can we bring some creativity through the regulatory process so that we can indeed start to, if not reduce right away, at least cap, and then work toward reduction? The bill does not stop the agencies from doing their regulatory process. What it does is it says that if indeed there is more than $1,000 net effect, the legislature has to be notified. There's nothing in here that says that the, notif the legislature has to approve the regulation. It's just saying that there is a notification. There is a restriction saying that if indeed it happens that the, uh, the, the regulation can't go into effect until after the legislature adjourns, which gives us a chance as representatives of the citizens that are trying to buy housing the opportunity to take in information, and if indeed we decide that we want to, or should, or have to make some changes, we can. If we don't do anything, the agency is free to go about doing what they were going to do. As far as the, um, the comments on um, the determination, the agencies are already charged with that in statute. The agencies have to determine whether it's cost effective and affordable before they go into a regulatory um, a process. So this isn't asking them to do anything that they shouldn't be doing already. It, it applies to new houses as well as remodeling. And again, looking at could somebody do what we did when we were a young family, buy a relatively small house that needed some work, go in there, do the work, and eventually sell the house and, and be able to move into a bigger house. 
So we're not only restricting those people that are not able to purchase a house, we're restricting people that can't go in, buy the little house, get it fixed up, and as their family grows, get into a bigger house. The support of the associations and the organizations on that letter, and I've, I've seen the letter, I've gotten the letter, of course. I don't see any that are there that aren't directly affected in a positive way or wanting to do this. Yes, there are a number of contractors on there, but they're generally the pipe fitters, the people that would do the sprinklers, which now there's another proposal to sprinkler all houses. There are companies and, and, and associations that have a vested interest in regulation. So do I discount what they're saying? No. Do I think that we shouldn't pay any attention to safety? Of course not. But I also look that there's a lot of people on the other side, independent contractors, that are being um, aced out of work because the people aren't building the houses. So fellow members, I'd ask that uh, we, we leave this provision in because we need to start being responsive to our citizenry so that they can, again, afford houses and, and, and do what you need to do when you want to grow your family. Thank you. Representative Subdean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just a few comments in uh, uh, response to uh, some of the uh, Representative Vogel's claims here. I, I, I really don't know where you got the 25 to 30 percent uh, uh, cost increase of uh, construction due to re uh, regulations. I, I don't know what hat you pulled that one out of, but uh, it's <laughs> it, it seems pretty unbelievable. I, I've done construction most of my life, and uh, I've never seen that to be the case. In fact, I just uh, had an independent contractor uh, build a deck for me, and he came in, and, he, and I had plans for him, and he said, no, we can't do this. He says, uh, there's a code here. You have to have the spindles on your deck so close so a baby's head can't get through it. There, there's reason for these uh, 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 codes and, uh, and regulations, and uh, they, they actually do protect the consumers as well. You mentioned do-it-yourself. Well, that, that's fine when you can do some of the uh, work yourself on a house and uh, maybe work your way up the, uh, the uh, real estate chain. That's, that's just great. But uh, you still have to uh, consider reselling that uh, piece of real estate. And it's got to be in good shape. And it's got to be safe. And it's got to be fuel efficient as well. That's, uh, that's a, quite a... Uh, selling point. If you've got energy standards in place and uh, you can sell an energy efficient house, you're going to get a little bit more money for it. Uh, so uh, you, you mentioned support from it, or actually uh, independent contractors being interested in this. I, I didn't see any uh, uh, quotes or any uh, information from uh, independent contractors uh, in committee or now. So uh, it's, it's uh, this is an unworkable piece of the bill, it's unnecessary, and back to what I said about the Sophie's Law, we don't uh, do a very good job of uh, oversight on some of these details, and if you take a look at the timeline on implementation of this, if the, if the codes came out after a six-year wait, it could take up to three years or maybe four to vet this again and get uh, legislative uh, approval on this. So again, this is a uh, vague language, it's meddlesome, and it's unnecessary. Thank you. The member from Ramsey, Representative Mahoney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, on my notes here, I had three points I wanted to make, but then Representative Vogel got up. <laughs> <laughs> and we just expanded. Um, in answer to Representative Sundin's question where the 30% came from, most of it came from suburban land use regulations. Let me repeat that. Where most of that 30% came from is suburban land use regulations and suburban fees that they put on for to put in parks, to put in curb streets, to uh, how, how big your lot has to be, which increases the land value. So there's a number of reasons for this. And 
Representative Vogel picked an easy, low-hanging fruit. But I will, um, there's two stories I'm going to tell here. One is some, that, something that we should all remember because we just went through it with the uh, sprinklers. And for our firefighters, you know, the firefighters wanted sprinklers. They thought that was a good idea, particularly the fire chiefs. And we came to the agreement underneath the code that we would put um, one hour fireproof sheetrock on the floor trusses. And we passed that. Or, or I think it was a rule making. Rule making. It wasn't, didn't come to the House floor. And that was the compromise that we did. Now, just so you understand, you have an average size basement in a 2,500 square foot house in suburbia Minnesota. That's 1,000 square feet. And the cost of one hour fire rated sheetrock is more than a dollar per square foot installed. Don't know that for a an absolute fact, but I'm pretty sure um, it's over a dollar and a quarter. Um, let's see, what, which one should I go to? Um, here's my issue with this particular piece of bringing it back to codes, all back to the state capitol to talk about. Representative Rarick, if I might ask, would you yield for a question? He will yield, Representative Mahoney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Rarick, you know the electrical code, correct? Representative Rarick. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Representative Mahoney, yes, I do. Representative Would he Mahoney. He will yield again. He will Repres yield. Representative Rarick, do you think you can bamboozle a pipe fitter on electrical code? Representative Rarick. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Representative Mahoney, I probably could. I, I, Representative Mahoney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think there's some firemen in this particular chamber. And if I ask those questions of that fire uh, inspector or building inspector, I bet you I'd get the same answer. So that coming back to us at the Capitol, I, I almost kind of would love to have that because between Representative Rarick and I, a couple other people up here, maybe a carpenter, we'd add the carpenter in, we could write the code. <laughs> and that would be kind of fun, except I'd have to read it a second time in my career at the Capitol. I spent over a year and a half reading codes back in 2008 when we tried to get as much of it out of this, cap this building as we possibly could. So here's the second story, and there might be a few people here that, that were here for that, for this particular story. If many of you might remember Representative Krinky. He and I agreed on almost nothing, absolutely nothing. And I was presenting a code bill. And Representative Krinky asked me a question, and I answered, Representative Krinky, yes, you could do that, and it would be just fine. Representative Krinky took a moment and said, I agree with Representative Mahoney, it's a good bill, we should pass it. The speaker at the time, Steve Swiggum, was doing pa the speaker kind of paperwork at the, ca at the desk. He stopped in stunned silence and grabbed the mic, unlikely to be done, but uh, grabbed the mic and said, members, when Representative Mahoney and Representative Krinky agree, we should vote on this now. What I'm trying to tell you is you start bringing this stuff back to the Capitol, we're going to have nothing but problems. If you want to do a code bill, I think my code recodification was about 300 pages. Yours is an amendment, a page long, page and a half long. I kind of know where this, where this vote's going to turn out, so I'm not going to take any more time at this. But this is a pretty dangerous precedent to bring it back to the Capitol to have us review codes. There are other ways to do it, and you could get those silos to work together. Um, and one other thing. All the trade unions and the Association of Building Contractors, the non-union, 
agree that this is a bad idea. And they rarely agree on much of anything. But just so you know, the people that do most of the building and most of the dealing with the inspectors don't like this. And one other thing, with Representative Vogel, there are a ton of houses in my district that sell for 200000 and less. And anyone that needs a, a young couple, because I have a bunch of them actually moving in now, can come over to my district, happy to have them, and they can buy a house for less than $200,000. The member from Hennepin, Representative Dean R. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, my college education looks specifically at codes. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm educated as an architect. And one thing I learned about the role of codes is it its role is public safety. The role of the code isn't to make sure that housing is affordable or that buildings are affordable for people. It's to make sure that people are safe. Uh, we have a process that we allow almost all of the stakeholders to be engaged in in developing codes. And, and the other thing that's really, really fascinating is our codes today aren't the same as they were 15 years ago, aren't the same as they were 30 years ago, because we learn new things, we have different types of uh, building systems that we put in place, more efficient ways of uh, actually driving down the cost. Uh, I think it was about 20 years ago, the thought of using plastic for your water in your house was really sort of unthinkable, and now we're able to use uh, plastic piping instead of copper piping, which saves cost on housing. Uh, so, so the role of codes is public safety. It's, it's really not to make things less affordable, and oftentimes the codes are in place aren't in place to protect the person that owns a home at the time, it's to protect the individual who may buy that home after them. Because once you do something in a house that requires you to take off the drywall and you seal it up, there's really no way of knowing what's done and you could create a really dangerous system. And I would challenge the notion that the increase of cost of housing is related to codes. If anybody hasn't been paying attention the past few years, the cost of all construction is increasing drastically. So, so to say that you know, $1,000, uh, that, that cost is really, really critical, I understand that for some young families it is. But we've also tried to do things about wages and livable wages here at the Capitol. And unfortunately, every time we try to do that, there's a lot of pushback and a lot of resistance. Fortunately, a few years ago, we were able to increase the minimum wage in the state of Minnesota with an um, automatic increase for cost of inflation. And, and our minimum wage will now uh, increase as cost of living goes up. That is, unless there's a bill, and I'm sure we'll probably see a bill at some point, uh, that actually changes that back. So when we think of cost of construction, that's one cost of owning a home. The purchase price is one cost of owning a home. I, I'm guessing most of us get utility bills. So the cost of energy impacts that. The cost of uh, our insurance is impacted on that. So there are many things we can do to actually make a house affordable long term uh, for individuals who may um, may lack the resources so that they're not spending more than 30% on their housing. But, you know, this session I've been amazed at all of the things that we're putting in place that the legislature has to have oversight, or that the legislature has to do this, or that the legislature has to make the approval. We're doing away with rulemaking, we're doing away with a lot of things and bringing it all to us. But I've yet to see the bill that turns us up into a year-round legislature. Because if we're being asked and required to do all of these types of things, to expect us to do that in a 120-day session, I think is not only naive, 
uh, I think it's really ignorant about what we do here. And the more and more and more that we put on our responsibility versus allowing these things that we put in place over the decades to make sure that they get done, because we're going to June, May 21st, and what we don't get done doesn't get done. Uh, I, I, I would hate to imagine if we're sitting here uh, a couple of years from now and all these things that you all are putting forward get passed and the adjournment date comes and we adjourn and it doesn't get done, well, then it's another year before these things begin to happen. So, so I actually think that uh, Representative Sundin's amendment to remove this language is really, really critical and I would hope that you all would support Representative Sundin's amendment. The member from Carleton, Representative Sundin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I promised the lead on my uh, uh, committee that I'd be uh, short-spoken, and uh, I'm going to hold to that, although he did not. Representative Garofalo. Uh, Mr. Speaker, members, for the reasons Representative Vogel mentioned and others, uh, I would urge members to vote no on this amendment. The member from Hennepin, Representative Hurtos. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's been an interesting debate about this subject, but I guess I want to share with you that what is ignorant is to refuse to accept the fact that government intrusion into the private housing market has been adverse and detrimental to home affordability. When we talk about permits, we talk about building permits to build a home. We need an HVAC permit to build a home. We need an electrical permit to build a home. We need a plumbing permit to build a home. We have to pay park dedication fees. We need a driveway permit. We have water access fees. We have sewer access fees. We need a well permit. We need a septic permit. And the list goes on and on. In addition to the permits, then there are all sorts of standards and codes that have been implemented whether it's make up air or category one energy standards, having to have raised heel trusses in the roof design, radon mitigation, everything just keeps piling on. In addition to these additional costs, builders have construction financing. You increase the cost, you increase mortgage origination fees. At the back end of the sale, you've got increased selling costs, realtors' fees, closing costs, mortgage registration tax, warranty deed tax, tax on tax, it just never ends. It just keeps going on. Representative Mahoney, you're correct. Much of the cost is land cost, which is done at the local level. And so we have to have standards. You're not allowed to build in our neighborhood. You can't build what many of us baby boomers grew up in, in the first suburban ring on a 50-foot lot with a modest little bungalow. That's what we lived in. But no, we have to have bigger lots. We have to have big landscape berms at the entryway. We have to have landscape monuments. You have to have homeowners associations if you want your plat approved. It goes on and on. Special street lighting, special sidewalks. Oh, and by the way, you can only put in the street lights that we approve at $7,000 a piece. Then there's the income part of it. To qualify for that mortgage, given current mortgage rates, even if you use a factor of $6 a thousand, every thousand dollars you add to the price, it takes $6 of additional income. Now that might not seem like a, a big deal, but that $6 is just the debt service, but you have to qualify for that mortgage. So now you got a factor of four. If you use 28 or 33% qualifying ratios, then, Every $5,000 that goes up in a house, you've got $30, but now you multiply that times three, it takes an extra $100 a month to qualify for that same mortgage. And so what you do is you drive people out of the individual housing market, and you force them into concentrated stack and pack housing along light rail corridors. Is that the design? Is that what everybody wants to live? Some do, many don't. They claim millennials want to live in the stack and pack housing along light rail corridors until they marry, until they have kids, until they want a place to let their children and their pets play out in the backyard. 
So there are a lot of issues here, folks, and I've built hundreds of homes and it never ends. It just keeps mounting. So what do we do? We have to have affordable workforce housing. Now we increase all these costs, and now we have to come back on the backside and supplant it by having more government programs so people can afford the expensive houses we made them build. What a bunch of redundancy. That's ignorance. So, Representative Vogel, thanks for bringing this. It's a good thing to have in the bill. Vote yes. The member from Ramsey, Representative Mahoney. Well, here's another first for me this evening. I never thought I'd say thank you to Representative Herschel. He just, everything he said, every permit is a local permit. And it is a charge by the local community. Almost everything other than the finance, banking, finance and banking piece, he's absolutely correct. But what he forgot to say is that it's a local fee. It's a local community fee. So Lakeville, Mudville, Pine City, wherever, they're using those fees as a piggy bank. If you asked for an audit of any of those cities and their fees, they would quake in their boots because there is a civil, there is a Supreme Court decision that says they can't charge anything more than the actual fee. And I'll bet each and every one of them would find themselves in violation. So members, you know, we know where this is going. The chair has said he doesn't want it, wants this on his, does want this on his bill. The governor has said that it's a, it's a non-starter with him. Let's just vote and get out of here tonight at some time before midnight. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of adoption of the A-19 amendment, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, no. No. The motion is not, is, does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted.